I want to make the greatest list Like no one ever could To rank all the Pokemon From the bad to the good Triple Duck It's Ben and Pete I know it's our destiny The comment section will disagree Triple Duck Gotta rank up all Gotta rank up all Triple Duck as we just demonstrated so elegantly through song, for today's ranked list we're talking about the gaming craze that swept the world when it was first released in the late 90s. Digimon. Uh, no, sorry, Pokemon. We're talking about Pokemon. Debuting in Japan in 1996 as Pocket Monsters Red and Green and reaching Western shores by 1998 as Pokemon Red and Blue, this role-playing series about catching creatures with fabulous powers and then making them beat each other up quickly became a pop culture sensation and it's enjoyed a level of success unmatched by any other video game franchise before or since. With 151 critters needed to fill the original Pokédex, there were plenty of Pokémon for players to fall in love with and claim as their favourite. But which one is objectively the best? Against our better judgement, we decided to find out. For this countdown, we've ranked all 151 original entries in the Kanto Pokédex based on their abilities in battle, rareness, easiness to catch, and their popularity in the gaming world and beyond. We're basing our assessments on their stats and abilities in those original games, so any increases or decreases in power they may have been subject to in future instalments will not be taken into account. Grab your Pokeballs and turn that baseball cap backwards because it's time to get to work. Let's rank them all. I'm the Bulbasaur bearing Ben. And I'm Pokédex pundit Peter from Triple Jump, and this is Every Generation 1 Pokémon Ranked From Worst To Best. Number 152. Missing No. Surprise bonus entry! How on earth could we talk about the Pokémon of red, blue and yellow versions without first paying homage to Missing No, the sprite criminal who stole our hearts? and sometimes our save file. A favourite of children the world over, this legendary glitch, or should I say bug-type Pokemon, <laughs> can be procured by first talking to the caffeinated old man in Viridian City and agreeing to let him show you his Weedle. I said what I said. Once that's done, simply fly to Cinnabar Island and surf up and down the right-hand coast of the waterfront town to eventually meet... Oh my god, what is that? A horrifying collection of brutalised pixels, Missing No is just that, a missing number, a Pokémon that isn't. It can appear with its level at an impossible zero, an equally impossible level of 146, or somewhere in between, and defeating it will cause the item in the number 6 slot in your bag to duplicate massively. Catch it, and the sprite presented within your party will often be that of a human man. Level it up from level zero, and it evolves immediately into Kangaskhan, a nice shortcut if you don't fancy trudging around the safari zone looking for one. As likely to help you cheat your way to 100 Master Balls as it is to permanently crash your game, Missing No is deserving of a place on this list, even if that place is last place because it's an affront to Pokemon God and shouldn't exist. Number 151. Magikarp. Now don't get us wrong, we love Magikarp, okay? We love its lore, its can-do attitude, its stupid little face, and the fact that it doesn't corrupt your game, but we have to be realistic here and admit that, at least when it comes to abilities, it sort of sucks. Even the Pokédex entry doesn't think much of the little fishy, with its description reading, an underpowered, pathetic Pokémon. Jeez, alright Pokédex, no need to be so harsh. A water type, Magikarp doesn't really have a lot going for it in terms of stats, though its base defense is quite high, its pitiful attack and HP levels aren't enough to make this worthwhile. Famously, the only move most caught Magikarp know is Splash, a maneuver that does literally nothing. Why is it even in the game? To anger us, that's why. In fact, it can only learn two more moves by levelling up alone, Tackle and Flail, and it also can't be taught moves by TM, rendering it almost useless. It can't even use Surf, which is ridiculous when you consider that it's a bloody fish. It's almost like Game Freak put this fella in Gen 1 just because they needed something to be the worst Pokémon available and it was better to create one that everyone would agree was terrible rather than have the community fight over it. Thankfully, it gets better when it evolves. Much, much better. Number 150. 
Caterpie. It's fair to say that most new red and blue players' first catch was probably one of the two Pokémon we're about to talk about. The first, Caterpie, appears towards the beginning of the game in Viridian Forest, and these little chaps are so abundant and easy to catch that it would be a bit embarrassing if a player wasn't able to get their hands on one. If this is you, then maybe give another game a go. Pokémonsters clearly aren't your thing. Caterpie is a bug-type Pokémon modelled on, you guessed it, a caterpillar. As it's found towards the start of Red and Blue, its levels and stats in the wild are usually quite low, making it rather ineffective against most stronger enemies that players will encounter as the game goes on. Still, that's not what it's there for. Caterpie is designed to ease trainers into the world of Pokémon without presenting much of a challenge. If they don't feel like catching the little wiggler, then they can be overcome nice and easily in battle, giving their starter some of that sweet, sweet XP. You do exactly what you're supposed to, Caterpie, but even so, in the grand scheme of things you're still a little bit rubbish. Number 149. Weedle. The yin to Caterpie's yang, the fish to its chips, the ant to its deck. Yes, that was an insect pun. Weedle is another bug type that shows up in Viridian Forest early into a new trainer's trip around Kanto. Based on a... Um, what is a Weedle based on? A worm? Anyway, whatever it's based on, Weedle actually has lower overall base stats than Caterpie, but has the advantage over its creepy crawly counterpart because it's also a poison type. This means that it can use the far more effective poison sting move right out of the gate, which has the added bonus of being able to cause effect damage. Weedle and Caterpie are designed to mirror each other in terms of their evolution, and as we'll find out later on, the final form of this prickly customer is much better than its smoother friends. Still, Weedle suffers from the same issues as Caterpie, those being that it's purposefully weak and easy to catch. Nobody in the history of Pokémon has ever gone, wow, I caught a Weedle, outside of their first playthrough, as this buggy fella is merely a stopgap on the way to bigger and better things. Number 148. Ghastly. The first in the only line of ghost Pokémon in the original 151, Ghastly first appears to players at the Pokémon Tower in Lavender Town, aka the place with the creepiest video game music of all time. Have a listen to that! I don't like it. Stop. You can stop it now. A floating orb of spectral energy, Ghastly's type makes it immune to any normal fighting or ground-type attacks, which is certainly a bonus. It's also got a simple yet highly effective design, with those eyes making it the sweetest-looking ghost since Casper. Aww. Unfortunately, for as much praise as we've given this adorable apparition, there's a reason it's so far down the list. For one, it can only be caught in one place, making it an absolute nightmare to get a hold of, and secondly, it's got some of the worst stats in the whole game meaning that if an opponent was to hit a move on it, they'd likely KO it in one shot. Finally, ghost-type moves are only super effective against psychic types and other ghost types, both of which are fairly rare in Kanto, and as such, there isn't much that this friendly bundle of spooks is strong against. Sorry, Ghastly, you're cute and all, but you're kind of useless. Please don't haunt me. Number 147. Abra. Abra is similar to Ghastly in a lot of ways. Both are the start of their own evolutionary chains, both are on the small side, and both are a little bit naff. According to the original Pokédex, Abra's powers are affected by the contents of its dreams. I'm glad I'm not Abra, otherwise all my powers would revolve around Sonic the Hedgehog doing the Macarena in his underpants. Abra is also one of only a few Pokémon ever that naturally learns the move Teleport, which can be used to escape battles. Unfortunately, this makes it a massive pain in the arse to catch, and it's the only move that it can learn via leveling up. This little mind reader gets a pass because of its ability to pick up several much stronger moves via TM, meaning that a trainer can make use of it in battle should they want to. Also, as annoying as it is, Teleport is a unique move in Gen 1, so we had to give Abra some credit for being able to pull it off. Number 146. Metapod. For our first evolved Pokémon of the list, we're going back to our old friends in Viridian Forest and taking a look at what happens when you get them to level 7. Metapod is the evolved form of Caterpie, and much like a caterpillar's life cycle in real life, its next stage involves sealing itself inside a tough outer shell. This is what gives this bug type its signature quality, the ability to use the move Harden. Now, come on, stop tittering back there. I can hear you, you know. Harden is a move that raises a Pokémon's defense stat for a battle, and it fits nicely with the whole cocoon thing that Metapod has going on. Unfortunately, though, this is another example of a Pokémon only being able to learn one move via leveling up. There was a whole sequence in the anime dedicated to two Metapod fighting each other where they just used Harden over and over to no effect. It was hilarious on the show, but is much less funny when you're playing the games. As a result, the green blob finds itself right towards the bottom of our rankings, but it does gain some major props for being the first Pokémon most players ever got to evolve. Number 145. 
cocooner. If you caught yourself a weedle instead of a caterpie, then you would find yourself with a cocooner instead of a metapod once you had worked hard enough to evolve it. Another half-bug, half-poison type, cocooner continues its previous form's trend of looking a bit evil, as it is one of the most angular Pokémon of all time. Seriously, look at those cheekbones. You could cut through butter with them, my word. Much like its mirror image, cocooner also suffers from the problem of only being able to learn harden. What puts it above metapod, however, is the fact that it can carry over moves from its previous form, meaning that it ends up with poison poison sting whilst the non-threatening cocoon is stuck with tackle. Also, as we mentioned earlier, the final form of cocooner is significantly better than Metapod, so you're better off putting up with this insect-based Pokepal. And no offence, but Metapod just looks a bit dopey, doesn't it? Admittedly, cocooner is less friendly looking than the Metapod, but I know which one I'd prefer on my team if I ever got in a fight, which actually happens a lot more often than you might think. You try working with Ashton and not resorting to violence. God damn it, a Ashton, Ashton, no, what have we said about playing with knives? Number 144. Kadabra. If you do manage to catch an Abra and are able to get it to level 16, your reward will be a slightly bigger version with a spoon in its hand. Kadabra is the middle stage of the Abra evolutionary chain, but it also has a fairly strong catch rate in the wild for a Phase 2 Pokémon. It grows significantly when it comes to base attack and defense stats, although these numbers are still lower than some unevolved Pokémon. Its moveset is far more extensive than just teleport, though, with this cutlery-wielding chap able to whack out confusion, Psybeam, and even a cheeky reflect should the situation call for it. Even with all these upgrades, however, it can still only learn a few Psychic-type moves on its own, which, as we discussed earlier, Earlier, are only effective against a handful of foes. Sadly, Kadabra takes a lot of effort to obtain and train, and if we're being realistic, it just isn't worth it. Perhaps the most interesting thing about Kadabra is that it got Nintendo into legal trouble with spoon-bending magician Yuri Geller, who claimed that the design was an unlicensed use of his image. Don't worry, though, because in 2020, Yuri said that the company could use the Pokémon again. Phew. I can rest easy tonight, then. Number 143. Diglett. A ground-type Pokémon, Diglett has to be one of the easiest creatures in the entire franchise to recreate. It's just a brown curve with some eyes and a pink nose on its face. This was clearly a Pokémon designed at about 4.30pm on a Friday. Diglett actually played a key role in the shaping of the Kanto region as they dug the passage that connects routes 2 and 11 in the game. This cavern, which carries the super-imaginative name of Diglett's Tunnel, is the only place in Gen 1 where these little burrowers can be caught. Even though they're very sweet and very easy to draw, there isn't much else to get excited about with this lot. Yes, they have a relatively high base attack stat for a Stage 1 Pokémon, but their 10 HP is the lowest base level in the game, meaning that they're very susceptible to one-hit kills. They can somehow use the HM cut, despite not having any arms, but other than that, there isn't much reason to add Diglett to your party, unless you're a fan of those memes where it's actually really muscular under the surface. And to be fair, those are good memes. Number 142. Voltorb. Okay, I take back what I said earlier, maybe Voltorb is the easiest Pokémon to draw. Essentially just a Pokéball with eyes, Voltorb is an electric type that can be found on either Route 10 or inside the power plant out past Cerulean City, where you sadly won't find a Pokémon version of Homer Simpson asleep at his desk. A Do-Imon, if you will. No? No, you don't like that one? Well, I did, so whatever. Voltorb also has the distinction of being number 100 in the original Pokédex, which is fun, but it doesn't make up for how below average it is. Voltorb's stats are broadly fine. Average HP for a Stage 1, below average attack, above average defense. This little sphere comes out as just okay, but in a world of fire-breathing dragons and sea monsters, just okay isn't going to cut the mustard. Yes, it can learn some nice electric-type TMs such as Thunderbolt and Thunder, which are effective against flying and water types but why would you settle for a living football when you could have another, cuter, much more interesting Sparky type instead? So, for being thoroughly uninspiring, Voltorb must contend with rolling around towards the tail end of our rankings. Number 141. Tentacool. If you go out on the water in the Kanto region, or just so happen to own the Super Rod, then chances are you'll have come across one of these slippery customers. Tentacool is a dual water and poison type Pokémon with a fairly diverse moveset on offer. It can learn normal moves, psychic ones, and even the grass type Mega Drain if you have the right TM, and it can pick up the HM's Cut and Surf as well. Sounds like a dream come true! And it would be if the stats weren't so embarrassingly low. It has the same base HP as a Weedle, and actually has fewer defense 
experience points than a bleeding Magikarp of all things. Despite its impressive roster of learnable moves, Tentacool on its own just isn't very strong. Also, as previously mentioned, they're a dime a dozen if you go surfing, which makes them much less desirable as a result. Still, it's always useful to have a water type on hand in case you need to traverse a lake or a river, so at least it's got that going for it. And if all else fails, I've heard that they taste absolutely delicious dipped in batter fried up and served with sweet chilli sauce. Cool Amari. Anyone? <laughs> Number 140. Rattata. Honestly, there isn't much to say about Rattata or Rattata, other than it's the Pokemon that looks like a rat. You can find this thing all over the place in Kanto, and any trainer with more than an hour of playtime under their belts will no doubt have caught one. They're a normal type, which is basically code word for a little bit boring, and they can't learn any HMs, so anyone without a pre-existing affection for rodents will struggle to get much out of this one. Its one saving grace is its relatively high base attack stat, which is almost double that of a Caterpie's. This, combined with its appearances early in the the game and its high frequency make it a decent objective for any players looking to bolster their initial arsenal. I suppose if you've got any surplus pokey cheese laying around, Rattata would also be a great way to get rid of it. Sadly, this just doesn't make up for the fact that Rattata isn't very interesting. Were it more powerful or more helpful, it might have gotten a pass. However, as it stands, it's more likely to get the same treatment as a real rat, i.e. a swift shooing from any building it enters. Number 139. Volpix. Oh, look at how cute it is. Come here, little Volpix. Let me stroke you. Oh, oh God, it set me on fire. Help! Get the fire extinguisher, it's happened again! In the running for the title of prettiest fire type ever, sorry, Embor, Vulpix is one of a few Pokemon not available in the red version of the original game. Instead, it can only be caught in blue and then traded over, and even then, it doesn't appear all that often. That is a bummer, especially when you look at its base stats, which are very unimpressive to say the least. Vulpix doesn't offer much in the way of firepower, pun very much intended, and it's also unable to learn any of the HMs in the game. Also, if you choose the fire starter, no, not that one, then chances are you won't need another flame breather in your party all that often. For all its faults though, Vulpix is still a decent Pokemon to have in your team, capable of picking up some powerful moves when leveled up high enough. Also, and I cannot stress this enough, look how adorable it is. Honestly, if a Vulpix told me to crash my car through somebody's living room, then I would seriously consider it. Number 138. Zubat. Basically, if you go into any cave in the Kanto region, a Zubat is more than likely to fly out of the darkness and hit you right in the face. From Mount Moon to Seafoam Islands to Victory Road, these flying leeches are everywhere, practically begging you to trap them inside a tiny ball for the rest of their natural lives. In fact, Zubat appears in most Pokemon games, with the first mainline installment not to feature them being 2022's Scarlet and Violet. Zubat is a dual flying poison type, which would make them an absolute nightmare if they actually existed. They can't use Fly, not until Gen 4 anyway, but can learn a range of attacks from the Bug-type Leech Life and the Grass-type Absorb to the Ghost-type Confuse Ray and the Ice-type Haze. These features set it apart from the low-level Pokémon we've already talked about, however, like someone wearing Ugg boots and sipping a pumpkin spice latte, they are still quite basic. Its stats are fairly unimpressive, and their constant cave appearances will quickly turn any joy a player had in seeing them to utter annoyance. They're worth catching, for sure, but don't expect to defeat the Elite Four with one of these vampire wannabes in your gang. Number 137. Alakazam. Rounding off the slightly tragic psychic-type evolutionary chain is Alakazam, the first Stage 3 Pokémon we've encountered so far. Also, Abra, Kadabra, Alakazam! Do you get it? It's very clever. Although it might get a stat boost after making the evolutionary jump from Kadabra, actually getting to this Pokémon is a hefty task in its own right. You see, Alakazam is the first Pokémon we've come across that only evolves via trading. Eager to make use of the Game Boy's Link Cable feature, Game Freak included a number of different Pokémon in Gen 1 that could only grow up when swapped with somebody else. It's a nice idea that definitely sold a flip load of cables and games, but it made life hell for any trainers who didn't have a trading partner. If you didn't have any friends or siblings who were into Pokemon, then trading evolutions were impossible, so unless you were willing to buy an entirely new Game Boy and another copy of the game, you were stuffed. Alakazam just isn't worth going through all this hassle. It gets such a minuscule upgrade from its previous form that you'd be better off just pretending you'd caught it and moving on with your life. Number 136, Staryu. 
Fans of the Pokémon anime series will instantly recognise Staryu as one of the primary companions of Misty, who should honestly have gotten some sort of award for putting up with all of Ash's nonsense during those early years. Seriously, early Ash was a dick, anyway. Modelled on a starfish, Staryu is a water type that is fairly common throughout Kanto, especially around the Seafoam and Cinnabar Island portions of the game. If you want to catch one, then just get your rod out, which sounds a lot dirtier than it actually is. Though it might be famous for its time on the TV show, Staryu doesn't really have a lot to offer gamers. Its stats are rather poor, and it can actually only learn two different water moves by levelling up. On the plus side, it can learn Surf, but its Pokedex entry says that it's only 0.8 metres tall, and I don't know about you, but I would not trust something that tiny to carry me across an ocean. In the games, Staryu is a bit of a washout, but anime fans will always have a soft spot in their hearts for the little star that could. Number 135. Nidoran, male. Now before anyone goes getting all confused, we want to clarify that Nidoran's male and female forms are counted as two separate entries in the Pokedex, and we're not just adding in gendered versions to pad the runtime. Whilst most Pokémon in the Kanto Dex are gendered and some have differing appearances based on sex, a female Venusaur's flower has a seed in it whilst the male's doesn't, for example, only one has different entries for male and female. The two sexes of Nidoran do have their own unique stats and figures, with the male half of the species coming in second place. These poisonous mouse-looking fellas can be found either on Route 22 or in the Safari Zone and are relatively easy to catch once you do track one down. Despite being a poison type, the only move of that kind they can learn on their own is the fairly weak Poison Sting, although they can pick up the fighting type Double Kick as well. Though it does well in attack for a Stage 1 Pokémon, the male Nidoran isn't much help beyond that, and you're actually much better off catching a female version. How much better off? Well, you'll just have to wait and see, won't you? No peeking ahead now. Number 134. Horsey. Only Pokémon could get away with making something that looks exactly like a seahorse and calling it Horsey. It's a good thing we love you, Nintendo, because that is unacceptably lazy. This adorable little ocean dweller is another Pokémon that's easily attracted with your rod, stop it, inhabiting the same waters as its star-shaped comrade. It's a water type, obviously, and can learn pretty much exactly the same moves as Staryu, so why has it ranked a little higher? The answer? Horsey has an absolutely mad base defense stat. This thing is incredibly tough for a creature that only weighs 8 kilos, making it difficult to deal damage to in battle. Its poor HP does let it down slightly, but you'll never badmouth a seahorse ever again once you learn how much punishment they can take. It's still not going to single-handedly defeat the Pokémon League for you, but Horsey's little secret makes it one of the most intriguing Stage 1 Pokémon in the game, and it can use Surf too, although the species is apparently half the size of a Staryu, so I'll probably just wait for the ferry if it's all the same. Number 133. Poliwag. Poliwag is a water-type Pokémon that is supposedly based on a tadpole, but if I ever saw a tadpole with eyes that big I would call the authorities because there has clearly been a nuclear waste spillage in the area. If I were to read out the list of different spots where one could find a Poliwag in Kanto, then this list would be twice as long as it already is. These guys and gals are everywhere, and can be caught just as easily with a lower level fishing rod as they can with one of the more powerful ones. Some would see this as a bad thing because it makes them less special, and to be fair, that's not 100% false. Still, Poliwag are just that little bit more well-rounded than Staryu and Horsey, even if they don't have the same mind-boggling defense stat as the latter. We have tried not to rank Pokémon too highly based on what they evolve into, but once you see Poliwag's future forms, you'll understand why it came out ahead of the other two. Now, if you'll excuse me, some people in hazmat suits have just turned up to run some tests on my tap water. Number 132. Ekans. Hey, guess what? This Pokémon looks like a snake, and its name is snake spelled backwards. I bet you'd never knew that, did you? Did you? Did you? Ekans is a little purple snake, and that's never a bad thing to be. Fans of the anime will recognize this wiggly wonder as one of Jesse's Pokémon, making this the first Team Rocket member we've come across today. Hopefully nobody will be doing any blasting off, because I simply don't have the energy for that right now. Though this poison type may be lacking in defense stats and only appear in Pokémon Red, it more than makes up for it with attacking power as it packs quite the punch for an unevolved pocket monster. Furthermore, it can learn the HM strength, which means it can push large boulders out of the way, the mental image of which I will never not find funny. What's it going to push them with? Its tiny head? <laughs> Highly unlikely. Blue owners might need to trade, but red players will find plenty of Ekans spread throughout the game, making it rather easy to add these little snacks to their collections. Number 131. Spearow. 
There's one flying type Pokemon that most red or blue players will encounter first in their journeys, but if you want to be a dirty little hipster about it, then you can always wait a tad longer and catch a Spearow instead. First cropping up on Route 3, Spearow is a normal and flying type designed to act as the mirror image of a certain other bird-inspired Pokemon that we'll be getting to in a little while. What sets it apart from that one is its much higher attack stat, essentially meaning that when this one pecks you, you'll know about it. As they appear so early on in the game, Spearow are not designed to be very threatening, and even with their high attack stat, they don't offer a particularly balanced battling experience due to their low HP and defense. Also, and maybe this is just me, but they look a bit evil? Like one would round up a bunch of its friends to poo all over your car just to tick you off. Maybe I'm being irrational, but when it comes to unevolved bird Pokemon, I will never not go for number 130. Pidgey. Now that's what I'm talking about. If you could somehow get your character in Pokemon to walk around with their eyes closed, then there's still a very high chance that they'd bump into and catch a Pidgey. These Pidgeon-inspired beasties are one of the most common sights in the entire game, and they're as abundant in red as they are in blue, so everyone gets a chance to have one. You get a Pidgey. You get a Pidgey. Everybody gets a bloody Pidgey. Though it might have slightly lower stats than Spiro, our fine feathered friend is just so iconic that it would be an act of war to put it below its winged rival. Catching a Pidgey is such an integral part of any Kanto region player's initial experience, to the point where when it came time to assign a Pokemon the HM Fly later in the story, chances are most people taught it to their Pidgey or its evolved form. Furthermore, in reference to my previous point about Spiro looking like a wrong one, this bird has one of the most trustworthy faces I've ever seen. I'd let it stay in my house whilst I was away on holiday. I'd even tell it where I keep the good snacks. Number 129. Haunter. Another evolved Pokemon now, Haunter is what happens when Ghastly grows up, gains a pair of detached hands, and develops an affinity for licking people. I too hope to reach this stage one day. Much like its spherical predecessor, Haunter can only be caught in the nightmare-inducing Pokemon Tower in Lavender Town, or through evolving your Ghastly at level 25. Despite the fact that it's supposed to be a more advanced version of the Floating Ball, there are no moves that a Haunter can learn that a Ghastly can't, which is a little bit of a shame. Unfortunately, most of what Haunter has to offer is a little underwhelming. Admittedly, it gains a bit of a stat boost from its previous form, but remember that those numbers were not very big to begin with. In fact, Haunter's stats are so unimpressive that you'd be forgiven for forgetting it had evolved from anything. At least, it's one step closer to one of the best-loved members of the original Pokémon cast, who we'll get to further down the line, but on its own, this little ghost will leave you shrieking in frustration rather than in fear. Number 128. Mr. Mime Dear Lord, what the hell were Game Freak thinking? To whoever turned up to work one day and said, I know what will be good for our upcoming children's game, something that looks like a human, only it has horrible spindly arms and a permanent creepy smile plastered all over its plastic looking face, I hope something bad ended up happening to you. Alright, nothing too bad, maybe like a paper cut or dropping a sandwich that you just bought. Oh, no. I've just looked at it again. The punishment has to fit the crime. To jail. This utter monstrosity was initially a psychic type, known in the anime for creating invisible barriers and for definitely getting it on with Ash's mum. In the game, however, outside of having a reasonably high base defense stat and a penchant for learning various defense boosting moves, there really isn't much to get excited about when it comes to this clown faced psychopath. Look, I'm sure Mr. Mime is nice, really, but its utterly bizarre appearance, combined with that horrible CGI one from Detective Pikachu, have really put me off. It. The fact that it's got poor stats, is hard to catch, and can't learn any HMs other than Flash, which is easily the worst one, only makes me feel better about my animosity towards it. Number 127. Chansey. Though it may look innocent with its egg pouch, pink complexion, and kind smile, Chansey is actually an absolute unit. A normal type best known in the anime as the doting assistant of the many nurse joys and therefore witness to all of Brock's relentless harassment over the years, Chansey comes equipped with the highest base HP in all of Gen 1. The second highest number is 160, but Chansey absolutely blows that out of the water with a whopping 250 health points to her name. That's right, I said her. Before any of you come at me for being a pokey sexist, all Chanceys are female. On the surface, it seems like this happy little tank is unkillable until you take a look at its other base numbers. In both attack and defense, Chansey comes up with a score of 5, which is by far and away the lowest in both of those categories. Whilst a record breaker, this Pokemon is far too unbalanced to be considered too highly, but we're grateful for all the work it's done for the Pokemon version of the NHS over the years. The day Chansey decides to go on strike is the day we're all doomed. Pay your Chanceys. Number 126. Meowth. 
Oh, I was so tempted to do this entire entry in a fake Brooklyn accent, but I decided that for the good of mankind, I should stop myself. You're welcome. That was it, that's all I'll do. Of course, we can't talk about Meowth without mentioning its hefty presence in the various Pokemon TV shows, serving as the talking sidekick to Jesse and James of Team Rocket fame. Debuting in the second ever episode of the anime, Meowth has gone from villain to hero to comic relief and everything in between over his long tenure, cropping up more times than most other Pokemon put together. He certainly had the most lines of dialogue of any Pokemon, that's for sure. So how does the species fare in the game? Well, not so great. Firstly, Meowth is a normal type, which isn't exactly the most exciting, and its limited and uninteresting moveset reflects that. Combine this with some poor base numbers and an inability to learn any HMs, and you've got yourself a pretty useless kitty there, friend. However, does any of that matter? Not at all. Meowth is so important to the Pokemon brand that it could know no moves at all and we'd still love it. I know it's a cat, but Meowth is still the goodest of boys. Number 125. Dratini. The end of the first Pokedex is made up almost entirely of legendaries, so what on earth is a baby dragon doing at Pokedex number 147 out of 151? All will become clear once you find out what it evolves into, but for now, let's focus on this adorable thing. If you go by the Pokedex entry numbers, then Dratini is the first ever dragon type in Pokemon history, despite the fact that one of the Kanto starters evolves into a literal dragon. That will never not confuse me. Dratini can only be caught via Super Rod in the Safari Zone, or weirdly, it can be bought in the game corner in Celadon City, which makes me feel a bit icky. That not only makes it incredibly hard to catch, which adds to its pseudo-legendary status, but also makes it slightly problematic. With decent enough stats for a Stage 1 and the ability to learn Surf, Dratini has a lot to offer any trainer patient enough to track one down. The fact that it's a dragon also adds to its cool factor, despite the fact that it looks more like a tadpole with a cotton bud stuck to its nose. Number 124. Mankey. Despite sharing its name with a British slang word meaning a bit disgusting, Mankey actually has a lot to offer trainers who like their Pokémon to hit hard and often. A fighting type, this powerful primate packs quite the punch with a severely impressive base attack stat for a pre-evolution beast. Its ability to learn moves like Low Kick, Seismic Toss, and Thrash, as well as non-fighting TMs like Thunder, make it a must-have for people who love watching a weird beige monkey thing knock seven bells out of made-up animals. Unfortunately, as they say in the sports, attack isn't always everything. I think. I, I don't know. I don't watch many sports. Mankey has fairly abysmal defense and HP stats, making it rather easy to take down if you can survive it for a few rounds. Furthermore, this is another one of those annoying Pokémon only found in the red version of the original game, meaning that half of all Kanto players had to dig out the old link cable in order to get one. It might be modelled on one of humanity's closest relatives, but Mankey will get no sort of family discount from me. Number 123. Drowsy. Hopefully this list hasn't made any of you feel drowsy. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, there's still 122 Pokémon left to go, so you'll need all your strength. Before we get into the actual numbers surrounding Drowsy, can we please first acknowledge its creepy Pokédex entry? Puts enemies to sleep, then eats their dreams, occasionally gets sick from eating bad dreams. That's it. I'm never closing my eyes ever again. Someone get me some cocktail sticks, please. Despite not being allowed within 50 yards of a school, this Pokémon doesn't do too badly for itself. Decent attack and defense, a solid amount of HP, and it can learn Flash, which really doesn't sound that great off the back of the school joke I just made, but ignore that. Sadly, that's all there really is to say about Drowsy. It's okay. It suffers the same issues as other psychic types in that it's only super effective against itself, and it's that little bit harder to catch than other comparable Mons, as it only appears in one place in the game. Still, if you're looking for the Pokémon equivalent of Freddy Krueger, then you've found it. Number 122. Omanyte. Unfortunately, those little blue things under Omanyte's eyes are tentacles, and not a moustache, which is a shame because they do make it look very distinguished. A rock and water type Pokémon, Omanyte is based on Ammonites, a group of extinct snail-like creatures that are commonly found as fossils. This reflects in how you get your hands on one of these bad boys in the game, as it's been resurrected from a helix fossil in the lab on Cinnabar Island. It's like Pokémon Jurassic Park, which is to say, somehow a more dangerous version of Jurassic Park. If players do choose to bring this mollusk back from the dead, they will be treated to a criminally underbalanced creature. Its defensive stats are through the roof, presumably because of its shell, but attack and HP leave a lot to be desired. 
The contrasting types work in its favor, though, as the ability to learn both water and rock type moves gives it the edge over its single type contemporaries. Unfortunately, the fact that Omanyte can only be acquired through one specific method is ultimately its downfall. It's a novelty, yes, but one that's actually a massive pain in the backside. Number 121. Doduo. Despite the fact that its name is the word Dodo with an extra letter, the Pokemon Doduo actually more closely resembles an ostrich. Considering how famously stupid Dodos were, though, this might be a blessing. Although it's modeled after a flightless bird only with an extra head for good measure, Doduo is thankfully able to learn fly, which is a massive tick in the pro column. It's also pretty powerful and quite quick too, as in canon, it makes up for its lack of innate flying ability by being able to run very fast. You can find Doduo in a number of different locations throughout Kanto, making them fairly easy to get a hold of. Sadly, they too have a serious balance problem, and not because of their spindly legs and massive round bodies. No, it's because their other stats don't quite match their speed or attack. It does have a pretty neat design though, even if it is a little mind-boggling when you try and work out how a bird with two heads would actually function in the real world. Thankfully, you're not in the real world, so you can just relax while zooming around the map on your twin-headed ostrich monster. Now that's a sentence that could only make sense in Pokemon. Number 120. Jinx. Oh boy, it's our first controversial Pokemon of the day! Someone release the confetti! Modern players might not know what we're talking about here, as there's nothing wrong with Jinx's current design. Sure, it's a bit creepy looking with its big lips and fake looking hair, but there's certainly nothing insulting about it. Sadly, anyone who lived through Pokemon's early days will remember that Jinx used to be a different colour, which, as you can see, was not a good look. I believe the technical term for this is a giant whoopsie. Anyway, Jinx was eventually fixed and has appeared in several more Pokemon titles since its debut in Red and Blue. In Kanto, it's an Ice and Psychic type Pokemon, which is a unique combo for those games, and comes with a decent roster of moves alongside a relatively high attack stat. Unfortunately, unless you play the Japanese version of Blue, the only way to get one is to trade a Poliwhirl for it in Cerulean City. And that seems like an awful lot of work to go through to get something that isn't that good and is also insensitive. <laughs> I'll, I'll pass, thanks. Number 119. Seal. Born in 1963, Seal rose to fame in the UK thanks to his breakout hit single, Kiss from a Rose. Oh, hang on, I'm reading from our Every British Soul Singer of the 1990s ranked from worst to best script instead. <laughs> Can't wait for us to release that one. In Pokeland, though, Seal, with two E's, because Nintendo clearly spent less than five minutes naming this one, is a water-type creature based on, you guessed it, a walrus, actually, but nice to see Billy getting some representation. Found mostly in the sea foam Islands, Seal doesn't give too bad an account of itself, with a strong base HP and fairly average attack and defense stats. It's a little bit harder to catch than other Pokemon, but makes up for it by being able to learn a couple of Ice-type moves and both Surf and Strength. I mean, now I'm imagining it balancing boulders on its nose like a beach ball, and I'm incredibly happy with that image. Not a knockout by any stretch, Seal will still get the job done. Plus, it's very, very cute. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to get back to our other list. Now, where are we going to rank Desiree? Number 118. Oddish. Oddish is a dual grass and poison type, and another red exclusive Pokemon. And to further rub it into blue players' faces, you can find blooming loads of them in that game. I hope you see what I did there. Blooming, like blooming, like how a flower blooms because it's a plant. Yeah, I thought it was good. In the original Pokedex, Oddish is known as the Weed Pokemon, which you can only assume means it loves the number 420 as much as we here at Team Triple Jump do. I live for that Snoop animation. If you like really irritating your enemies, then Oddish might be the Pokemon for you, because it can learn a bevy of moves that will really tick people off. Sleep Powder, Stun Spore, and Poison Powder will all leave your opponents asleep, paralyzed, poisoned, and thoroughly annoyed. 
Unfortunately, it takes until level 15 to learn even one of those moves, and up to that point, the only move Oddish can do is absorb. Oh boy, my favorite. Whilst it can get good eventually, it takes a lot of hard work on the part of the player to achieve Oddish's full potential. And that's not something that everyone is up for. I don't play video games because I'm patient, I play them to watch sprites of mythical animals fighting each other. Number 117. Bellsprout. Resembling a tiny vine with a shocked face emoji stuck on top of it, Bellsprout acts as the blue version equivalent of Oddish, as in it isn't in red at all but can be found constantly in its counterpart as players embark on their cobalt-tinged tour of the Kanto region. Its presence throughout the journey and high catch rate makes it a viable option for any trainer yearning to catch a grass type, and he could do much worse than this petite plant. Bellsprout is packing some serious attack stats, almost on par with Mankey, which is mad because the latter is a monkey with fists and the former grows between your patio tiles. Unfortunately, the fact it's not available in both versions of the game, to say nothing of its practically non-existent defense stats, prevents Bellsprout from attaining a higher position on this list. However, Bellsprout has a very special attitude that we can't not appreciate, something that no other Pokemon has or will ever have. You see, in the original Kanto Pokedex, and therefore the overall Pokemon listings, Bellsprout is number 69. God, and we've just had Oddish, who was at the honorary 420 position. I think we can all agree that that's very, very nice. Number 116, Kabuto. If players choose to take the Dome Fossil over the Helix Fossil in red or blue, then their reward will be Kabuto instead of Omanyte. Remember Omanyte, the little blue guy from a few entries back? <laughs> You've forgotten him already, haven't you? Yeah, fair enough. It might look like a button mushroom, but Kabuto is actually a rock and water type, much like its undead counterpart, which means you can surf around on its tiny mushroom-like head to your heart's content. Whilst Kabuto might have lower HP and defense stats than Omanyte, it's only just behind in those areas, and its attack is double that of the slug. Its insultingly tiny base HP of 30, which is lower than that of Caterpie, keeps it from climbing too high up this list. However, as a result of being that little bit more balanced than Omanyte, we've given the fossilized fungus the nod in this battle of prehistoric Pokemon. Alright, fine, it's not really a mushroom, it's actually based on a trilobite, an extinct genus of aquatic arthropods that existed about 521 million years ago. Are you happy now, paleontology section of the comments? I know you're watching. Number 115, Butterfree. If you somehow manage to get your Metapod to stop using Harden long enough to reach level 10, you'll be rewarded with its final form a bug-slash-flying type named Butterfree. Now, butterflies have wings, right? And so do Butterfreeze. So why in the name of Nurse Joy can Butterfree not learn the move Fly? And don't tell me it's because it's not big enough because I was surfing on a mushroom earlier. Despite this glaring error, Butterfree still comes equipped with an impressive set of moves, including several psychic attacks such as the powerful Psybeam. Unfortunately, as it evolves from such a weak base even at stage 3, this Pokemon is severely lacking in the stats department. Still, considering how early players encounter Caterpie in the game, there's every chance this is the first Mon they will evolve all the way to the end, which gives it a certain sentimental edge. Also, speaking of emotions, it's been about 30 years since Ash said goodbye to his Butterfree, and I'm still not over it. Don't go, Butterfree! Ash still needs you! Someone pass the tissues, please. My eyes have just evolved into a water type. Number 114, Doug Trio. If you thought that one head sticking out of the ground without a body was confusing, then you're gonna hate it now that there's three of them. The evolved form of Diglett, Dugtrio is still a ground type, and by the logic of maths, it should be three times better than its pre-evolved form, right? Unfortunately, like it did during my GCSEs, maths has failed me once again. Dugtrio does get a boost from its single-headed forerunner, including boasting a very spicy base attack stat, but that still doesn't make it overly impressive. 
It inherits Diglett's staggeringly low HP numbers, and its defense stats don't grow enough to balance that out. In short, Dugtrio is a bit of a sitting duck. A, a sitting duck trio? No, I, I apologize. It might pack a powerful punch, but if you get one good shot in against this underground unit, you'll find that it actually has three sets of glass jaws. Also, I know we're only talking about Kanto today, but I feel I should say there is an Alolan version of Dugtrio, and it has hair! This little tidbit has nothing to do with its ranking on this list, but I just couldn't not mention it. I mean, look at those locks! Do I hate them or not? I think I might be in love, actually. Number 113, Magnemite. To quote Jesse from Breaking Bad, Yeah, friends, magnets! That is definitely 100% what he said. No, don't go and look it up, just trust me. Another inhabitant of the power plant, Magnemite is an electric type Pokemon with access to strong moves like Thundershock, but also rubbish moves like Tackle. Since Magnemite's weight is just 6 kilograms, I can't help but feel like it would struggle to tackle anything more hefty than a cardboard box. For a stage 1 Pokemon, Magnemite has a very impressive defense stat, but this is cancelled out by some pretty darn dreadful attack and HP numbers. Still, even though it can only be found in one place, you can't move for Magnemites in the power plant, making them pretty easy to add to your arsenal. Fun fact, Magnemite is so popular in the Pokemon community that it's one of only a handful of beasties to appear in every single generation of the games, which is an impressive feat. I guess the game designers found this Pokemon very attractive. Ha ha ha, magnet jokes. Number 112. Nidoran female. Finally, 23 entries after its male equivalent, we find the female version of Nidoran, which is conclusive proof that women are 23 times better than men, because that's definitely how maths works. Maths aside though, there's now no denying that we are feminists here at Triple Jump, I don't want to hear otherwise. As a result of the only gender divide in the Kanto Pokedex, we're talking about the poisonous mouse once again, which must be great for the Nidoran fans, or Nida fans, as they like to call themselves, probably. The female version can be found in exactly the same places as the male one, and it can still only learn one poison type move, Poison Sting, without any help. So why is it so much higher up the list? Well, like Shakira's hips, the numbers don't lie. Whilst male Nidorans have the upper hand in terms of attack, the ladies have the advantage in both HP and base defense, and by quite a considerable margin too. When everything is added up, female Nidorans have an 11 point lead over the blokes, which is an astonishing discrepancy when you consider that they're technically the same Pokemon. The gap between the genders does get smaller further down the evolutionary chain, but when it comes to stage one, we've gotta go with the girls. Number 111, Venonat. Oh, look at this cute little bundle of joy. I just want to touch it and cuddle it and- Oh god, it's deadly poisonous! Part bug, part poison type, Venonat is allegedly based on a gnat, although I don't think you'd die if one of those bit you. Rather annoyingly, even though it's half poison type and its name alludes to the word venom, it can only learn one poison type move, which is poison powder, and it isn't even an attack, it's just a status changer. Don't let this fool you though, as the gnat can also learn some very powerful psychic type attacks, including confusion and psychic beam, as well as the draining bug type move, Leech Life. And Venonat didn't choose the Leech Life, the Leech Life chose Venonat. Anyway, in terms of stats, Venonat doesn't do too badly, but then again, it's nothing to write home about either, and it struggles on the TMHM front as well. Maybe it could use those teeth to learn cut? No, actually. Well, what HM can it use? Flash, apparently. How does that work? No idea. Maybe the same way fireflies do? It's, I don't know, I'm lost. Biological inconsistencies aside though, you could do much worse than Venonat, but there are far better choices to place in your party. 110 of them, as it turns out. Number 110, Paras. Part crab, part insect, part mushroom, Paras might be considered sweet looking were it not for those awful horizontal teeth. 
They're just so unsettling. Oh, get them away. A bug type and grass type, it can be found in the shadow of Mount Moon, the safari zone, and in the vegetable section of any good supermarket, nestled in amongst the cabbages and potatoes. Although it boasts two different types, one of the strongest moves in Paris's natural arsenal is Scratch, a normal type move that it knows right from level one. And it actually can't learn any grass type moves that will inflict instant damage, which is more than a little disappointing. It can learn Slash, which is still a normal type, but very powerful, though you'll need to get it up to level 34 for that, by which point it will already have evolved. It does boast a fairly decent base attack, and its defense isn't too bad either, but with low HP and a fairly unimpressive catch rate in the wild, Paris's potential quickly goes as sideways as its weird teeth. Although I have heard that there's a male Paris out there who's pretty good at parties. They say he's a real fun guy. And I'll get my coat and leave now, sorry about that. Number 109, Clefairy. This cute pink splodge is one of only two fairy-type Pokemon in the original 151. You can tell that because it has the word fairy in its name. <laughs> what will Game Freak think of next? Clefairy was originally promoted as the joint mascot for the Pokemon series, alongside a certain electric mouse. But the yellow guy's popularity vastly eclipsed that of Clefairy's, making it the Alex Kid to Pikachu's Sonic the Hedgehog you know, if Alex Kidd lived inside a tiny ball. Without mascot status to carry it, Clefairy will have to settle for a below average placement on this list. It's quite difficult to catch, as it's really rather rare to find one in the game, and if you want to attack or defend with it, you'll find yourself thoroughly disappointed. Unfortunately, fairy-type moves wouldn't be introduced until Gen 2, meaning the majority of Clefairy's offense was boring old normal types. Ugh, gross. At least it's a unique type, though, which is interesting, and it's got a pretty solid base HP, making it a teeny pink tank. In another universe, you might be watching this video snuggled up in your Clefairy onesie, instead of the bright yellow red-cheeked number I'm sure you're all currently sporting. But alas, it wasn't to be. Number 108, Growlithe. No, oh, now look how adorable this Pokemon is. Oh, the cute ones are coming thick and fast, aren't they? Growlithe is a little bundle of joy, and if it were real, then pet shops around the world would fall over themselves trying to stock them. They can be playful, majestic, and powerful, so they're basically the ideal animal companion. You know what? Forget the rest of the list. Growlithe is the best. Number one, Growlithe. No, no okay, I'll, I'll carry on. Sadly for this furry little fire type, Growlithe's stats are not as remarkable as its looks. It boasts a nice attack digit, but falls behind the rest of the class in the other two main areas. It also can't learn any HMs, which is weird, because Cut is an HM, and this Pokemon definitely has claws. It can learn Ember, a decent fire move, early in its life, but if you want to unlock the super powerful Flamethrower, you'll have to grind away until level 50, which basically means you'll be there until the end of the game. So yes, Growlithe has its flaws, but it still packs a nice punch for an unevolved Pokemon, and as you can probably tell from this entry's intro, it has won over our right Writer's heart and the rest of us here at Team Triple Jump. Oh, Godspeed, you little fluffball. Number 107, Farfetched. Farfetched has the distinction of not only being the only original Pokemon to have punctuation in its name, but it's also one of only two creatures in the entire franchise to come with a free leak. If you're ever making a stew and get caught short of ingredients, then you know who to turn to. Now, it might not be able to use its vegetable accessory as a weapon, but there's still a lot to like about Farfetched. It's got fairly consistent stats, which, while not mind-blowing, are quite decent for something that doesn't need evolving. It's also a flying type, meaning it can use fly. Although I don't know where the leak goes when it needs to flap both of its wings, and quite frankly, I, I don't want to know. Oh. Unfortunately, our feathered friend does come with one considerable drawback. It can only be obtained by trading a Spearow with one of the in-game NPCs in Vermilion City, which means you'll have to catch one of those and then give it away before you can complete your Pokédex. If you ask me, that's a pretty far-fetched way to get your hands on a Pokémon. Sorry, I, I just had to say that. Number 106, Goldeen. 
Goldeen is, according to the Pokedex, the goldfish Pokemon, which must mean that A, the only way to catch one is to knock down some coconuts at the local fair, and B, they can be defeated by being flushed down the loo. Well, you can put that tropical fruit down now, because they're actually readily available almost everywhere in the Kanto region. If you stick your fishing rod into the water, chances are you'll pull it up with a Goldeen on the other end. Think of them as the deserted shopping trolleys of the Pokemon world. Players who do catch one are in for a treat, as Goldeen comes equipped with some killer stats. Strong attack and defense make up for a relatively low HP, but considering just how simple it is to get one of these elegant fishies, we're willing to let that slide. Additionally, and this is totally random, but it can use the flying type move Peck straight out of the gate, giving it an advantage over the grass types it would usually be weak to. Much like me doing DIY at home, Goldeen isn't amazing, but it does just about get the job done. You might have to beg it not to take your man, though. Goldeen, Goldeen. Number 105, Electrode. Who's that Pokemon? It's clearly an Electrode. Oh, it's a Jigglypuff, as seen from above. Electrode, the evolved form of Voltorb, does little to convince players that its species aren't the roundest boys to ever live or the laziest Pokemon ever conceived, as it's still just a Pokeball with eyes, only this time with the colors the other way around. Wow, such ingenuity. Whilst it does get a tasty stats boost compared to its smaller form, Electrode can learn no new Electric-type moves upon evolving, which means you have to teach it moves like Thunderbolt and Thunder via TM. Now those aren't cheap, you know, and I'm not made of… Uh, what's the currency in Pokemon called again? I've only ever seen it written down as that little squiggle. Ah, Pokemon dollars. Right, thank you. Furthermore, Voltorb doesn't evolve into Electrode until level 30. 30? That's like 10 more than 20, and 15 more than 15, and 20 more than- Okay, I'll stop now. But further, furthermore, the stat increase still only puts it in line with the number of Stage 1 Pokemon. So whilst its numbers are higher, there's still not a great deal to brag about. Roll on home, Electrode. You're done. Number 104, Execute. Execute are, according to Pokemon lore, a group of six different life forms that can communicate telepathically. It's a bit like the staff here at Team Triple Jump. But rather harrowingly, each Execute always has one life form that's broken and has yolk dripping out, which. Oh my god, does this mean one sixth of every Execute is actually dead? Is it lugging around the equivalent of a dead tooth? Oh, that's no good. Before I throw up, though, let's talk about Execute's abilities in battle. And you know what? They're okay. It makes up for a subpar attack with a strong combo of defense and HP, making it rather hard to crack these eggs. Unless you're talking about the already broken one. Oh god, no, I'm thinking about it again. It's let down by its moveset, though, which only contains two actual attacking moves. One is Barrage, which it learns from level 1, and the other is Solar Beam, which it learns at level 42. Yeah, that's a long time to wait between attacks. With moves like Leech Seed and Poison Powder, though, you could just use it to take punishment whilst slowly draining your enemy of its power. Additionally, as it's a joint grass and psychic type, you can use TMs to grant it psychic powers. So there you go. Sorry, I'm still thinking about that broken egg. I hope it gets the medical attention it needs. Head wounds are no yoke. Number 103, Persian. Anyone who's watched the original Pokemon anime will have been trained to hate Persian from an early age, as this is the creature that tormented Team Rocket's Meowth about being Giovanni's top cat. Don't listen, Meowth, you're twice the cat Persian is! Though its unevolved form is a moggy shown standing on its hind legs, Persian is… well, it's just a cat, isn't it? It's a little longer than your average feline, but that's all it is. Not exactly an inspiring design choice by any metric. Although it does beat Voltorb and Electrode in those stakes, I suppose. It can't learn any HMs, which is annoying, but Persian's normal type is actually quite helpful when it comes to TM as it's able to pick up water-type moves like Bubble Beam and Water Gun, and electric-type moves such as Thunderbolt and Thunder. Even with this positive, though, Persian is still pretty dull, and its natural moveset reflects that. Oh look, all normal-type moves. Groundbreaking. 
Had we been going on feelings alone, Meowth would have trounced this trumped-up tabby, but we are bound to at least partially go with the numbers in this list, so Brooklyn's number one cat will have to take a back seat. Number 102, Psyduck. If this list were entirely based on numbers, then there's no way Psyduck would be this high up. Its stats are not that impressive, falling way below the average for similar Pokemon in this portion of the countdown. But come on, this is Psyduck we're talking about. The guy's a legend! Thanks to Misty owning one in the anime, who turned out to be a brilliant agent of chaos, Psyduck now has something of a cult following in the Pokey community, even cropping up in 2019's Detective Pikachu, where it was once again just there to cause carnage. Despite only being a water type though, Psyduck can learn the psychic type move Confusion all on its own. If you get it to a high enough level, it can also pick up Hydro Pump, the most powerful water type move in the entire game. So there you have it. Psyduck isn't just in this position because we find it funny, it's got a lot to offer potential owners, and, as you'll find out later on, its evolved form packs a mighty punch. In truth, though, we also put it this high in the list because we do find it funny. <laughs> Look at it. Look at its silly face. Number 101, Jigglypuff. We've already seen it once from above, but now it's time to take a full 360 degree look at the jiggliest Pokemon of all time. When it's not being really irritating in Super Smash Bros, stop putting me to sleep, you menace! Jigglypuff can be found on Route 3 of the Kanto region, where players have a fairly decent chance of catching one. Initially a normal type, although it would gain joint fairy status in later games, JP can learn the powerful move Psychic via TM, but most of its leveling up moves are normal. This includes what's arguably its signature attack, Sing, which puts opposing Pokémon to sleep with its sweet melodies. Oh, I'm getting tired just talking about it. Jigglypuff is only one of a handful of Pokemon in the Kanto decks to have a base HP of over 100, making it incredibly hard to put down. It'd be even harder to put down if its base defense were over 20, however, which is one of the lowest figures for that particular stat in the original 151. Still, Jiggles is a classic Pokemon in every sense of the word. But if you use one as your Smash main, then I hate you. Number 100, Ditto. Oh god, that used chewing gum has a face. Oh. Wait, no, sorry, it's just Ditto. Ditto is completely unique in the sense that the only move it can learn is Transform, but to be honest, that's the only move it needs. Transform allows Ditto to steal the identity of any Pokémon it's in battle with, transferring over appearance, type, ability, stats, and moves. So, for example, if you're in a battle with a trainer who happens to have a Mewtwo on the field, then BAM! So do you! <laughs> Sneaky little bugger, isn't he? Now, if Ditto can become any Pokémon, then surely it must be good, right? Well, sadly not, because whilst it does copy across stats and moves, it retains its original level and HP, meaning that a level 5 Ditto is still going to be weak against a level 70 Snorlax, unfortunately. The fact that they're one of a kind is is still impressive though, and in the anime, Ditto is responsible for one of the greatest screen grabs in Pokemon history, which, you know, has to count for something, right? Number 99, Eevee. Look at it! Look how adorable Eevee is! Bow before its cuteness and tremble in the presence of its mighty hugability! <coughs> Sorry, I don't know what came over me there. Everyone who's ever played Pokemon knows Eevee, or at least they should. It's one of a handful of creatures to get the spotlight in multiple games, including as your rival starter in Pokemon Yellow and as a companion in Gen 1 Remake, Let's Go Eevee. The reason for this? The Eeveelutions, of course. By giving this little fluff bucket the corresponding stone, it can evolve into eight different forms. In Gen 1, it has just three possible evolutions, but that was still enough for players to go absolutely wild for it. Although it has a lot of potential, and as I mentioned earlier, it's the sweetest looking thing ever made, Eevee on its own is a bit… well, r rubbish? Please don't hurt me for saying that, I'm about to end on a high. A, a normal type with low stats and a poor catch rate wouldn't normally set the world on fire, but an exception has to be made for one of the most iconic pocket monsters of all time. After all, Eevee is far too beloved 
to be in the bottom 50. Number 98, Jolteon. Whoa, hang on a second. I hear you squeal. You're telling me that one of the Eeveelutions is just one place higher on this list than its base Pokemon? This is an outrage. I'm going to write a strongly worded letter about this. And to that I say, one, you don't have to write a strongly worded letter. Write a strongly worded comment. And two, just let me explain myself before you write a strongly worded anything, will you? Yeah, thanks. When given the Thunderstone, Eevee evolves into Jolteon, which, if you hadn't already guessed, is an electric type. That means it's able to learn the ultra-powerful move Thunder, albeit at level 54, as well as moves like the fighting type Double Kick and the bug type Pin Missile. Weird choice, but okay. However, these are the only major upgrades an Eevee will get if its trainer chooses to go down this path. Jolteon gains just a 10-point stat boost in all categories when it evolves, which, as you'll find out later, is much lower than the other two EV options. Considering that Thunderstones can only be bought for a high price in one place in Kanto, the Celadon department store, Jolteon really doesn't seem worth it. When it comes to Eeveelutions, we think this is the one to avoid. Comment sections down below if you need it. Number 97. Magneton. In Pokemon lore, Magneton is formed when three Magnemites are joined together by a powerful magnetic force. Does that mean the Magnemites cease to exist? Are their souls absorbed into one hulking new creature and lost forever? Probably best we don't think about that for too long. In the games, Magnemite evolves at level 30, which is one of the higher levels needed for evolution, but there are much worse offenders for that. We've mentioned the move Thunder a lot on this list already, but surely a powerful electric type like Magneton can learn it, right? Well, only by TM. Hmm, that's a shame. Though its powers do get a boost, Magnemite's HP and attack were so low to begin with that Magnetons are only just above average. Has it got a tasty bit of defense in its corner? Absolutely, but that's not enough to win battles on its own. Magneton could have been so much more, but there are just too many little things wrong with it to warrant placing it any higher in this list. Don't be too sad for it, though, as in future games, it gets to evolve into Magnazone, which looks like a spaceship. And spaceships are, as we all know, very cool. Number 96, Coughing. Whilst Jessie got given a weedy little Ekans to fight her battles with in the anime, Team Rocket's James had a much better soldier in his army. Meet Coughing, a Pokemon designed to make the horrific threat of air pollution appealing to young children. They are a poison type, taking the form of a small floating ball of noxious gas, which I also just realized would make for a very satisfying insult. Hey, Editor Alex, you're a small floating ball of noxious gas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, he's crying. No, please come back and finish the Players in search of a coughing can find them solely at the Pokemon Mansion on Cinnabar Island, where they will appear fairly regularly and are quite easy to catch. They come equipped with two moves, Tackle and Smog, and learn their first new attack, Sludge, at level... Oh, 32. Yikes, that's a lot of grinding. Nevertheless, for a Stage 1 Pokemon, Coughing comes equipped with some nice stats, including a crazy high defense number. If you're willing to make that grind, or take the easy way out and boot up some TMs, then Coughing is a very useful addition to your team, even though it will definitely give you asthma if you stand near it for too long. Number 95, Poliwhirl. If you can get your Poliwag up to level 25, it will evolve, gaining arms, a bigger body, and losing its mouth. Hmm, that doesn't seem like an evolution to me. Anyway, congratulations, you have a Poliwhirl now, and let's just hope it has another way of eating and breathing that we don't know about. Perhaps its bottom. Poliwhirl is cool for the fact that its base HP, attack, and defense stats are all 65, which keeps everything nice and tidy. 65 isn't a super high stat in Pokéland, but it is an improvement over Poliwag, and Poliwhirl also gains the ability to use the HM Strength. 
combine this with the surf it could learn previously, and you've got yourself a very handy tool for crossing oceans and moving boulders. This goes a long way to making up for those less than impressive stats, and the fact that they can't actually learn any more moves than its predecessor. Apparently, Poliwhirl is one of the most marketed Pokemon of all time, possibly because Nintendo have been able to hypnotize people into buying stuff through that swirly pattern on its chest. Of course, corporate masters, I will renew my subscription to Switch Online. Number 94, Nidorino. Hi Dilly ho, Nidorino! <laughs> Sorry, I've been waiting all this to make that joke. The first evolved form of the male Nidoran, Nidorino evolves at level 16, which is pretty low considering everything you get from him. The stats all go up and by some way too, turning the wimpy little rat from before into a much less wimpy uh, rat. He's still a rat, I can't change that I'm afraid. Whilst it's still not a world beater, Nidorino is a very easy option for players players wanting to get their hands on something fairly powerful quite quickly. Getting Nidoran up to level 16 is a doddle, even with a weak one, and if you don't feel like growing one, then you can head to the Safari Zone and attempt to catch a Nidorino, as their rarity and catch rate are also quite favourable. It's still not on the same level as its female counterpart, but Nidorino is a marked improvement on what came before. Also, fun fact, at the start of the very first episode of the anime, we see Ash watching a battle on TV featuring a Nidorino, making it one of the first Pokemon to be featured on screen in the entire show. I bet you didn't Nidorino that, now did you? Number 93, Venomoth. Venomoth is the evolved form of Venonat, which makes perfect sense because, as we all know, gnats in the real world grow up to be moths. It's basic science, really. Whilst its stats are higher and it gains a cool pair of wings, it still can't use fly though, what a ripoff. This poisonous moth suffers from the same problem as its flightless forebear, in that it can only learn a single, ultimately unimpressive poison type move, Poison Powder. Yes, it can learn other poison moves in future games, but that wasn't exactly much comfort to players back in 1996, now was it? And all this for a Pokemon that evolves at level 31, which is, hang on, let me do the maths, uh, carry a 2, multiply by pi, it's one more than Magnemite's level 30. <laughs> Sorry, that was a lot of brain power there. Still, being able to inflict repeating battle damage on an opponent is helpful, and Venomoth is more powerful than its previous form. It's got a nice design as well, keeping the purple colouring of Venonat whilst adding an elegant body and some unintentionally hilarious buggy saucer-like eyes. You could eat your dinner off those peepers. I wouldn't though. Would you, Ben? Number 92, Gengar. The other half of that TV battle that a young Ash was watching all the way back in Pallet Town was a Gengar, which has gone on to become quite the fan favourite since its inauspicious debut. The final stop in the ghastly and haunter run of evolution, Gengar came 10th in the first ever Pokemon of the Year vote in 2020, which I honestly didn't realise was a thing until just now. This is possibly because Ash caught one in an episode of the show that year and it went on to become one of his aces, although our writer wouldn't know anything about all of that because he's a grown man and definitely doesn't watch Pokemon anymore. Yep. Unfortunately, Gengar in the first game isn't actually all that impressive. For a final stage of evolution, its stats are towards the lower end of things, and it still has all the same ghost-type shortcomings that we spoke of earlier. Furthermore, it's yet another Pokémon that can only be evolved by trade. Hooray! In spite of this, the fact that Gengar is still getting new wrinkles added to its character over 20 years on from its debut shows that there's a lot of love out there for this tubby spectre. Number 91. Shelda. Shelda is, well, it's a clam, with its tongue poking out. Do clams even have tongues? My knowledge of biology has been fundamentally shaken by this list. This raspberry-blowing mollusk has a base HP of just 30, which for context is way lower than second from bottom Caterpie, so what's it doing all the way up here? Well, it has a fairly decent attack stat, not great, but good. Uh, oh, and it just so happens to have a base defense stat higher than flipping Mewtwo's! 
See, now you understand. Because its outer casing can, according to the Pokedex, repel any kind of attack, you'll have a tough time trying to pierce Shelda's defense in battle. On the offensive side, Shelda can learn a couple of Ice-type moves, Aurora Beam and Ice Beam, as well as Clamp, its own signature move that deals repeated damage on every turn of a battle. Chuck in the fact that it can use Surf and is relatively abundant throughout Kanto, and Shelda just keeps getting better and better. Although, remember, if you have two of these Pokémon, make sure you share one with a friend. You don't want them to accuse you of being... Uh, shellfish? Number 90. Cubo. According to the Pokédex, Cubone wears the skull of its dead mother on its own head. Hang, hang on a minute. This is supposed to be a game for children, you sick freaks, Nintendo! Harrowing backstory notwithstanding, Cubone is a ground type that can be found amongst the critters creeping about in the Pokémon Tower. It can be caught with relative ease, and once players have one in their collection, they'll be able to use it to unleash two exclusive moves on their enemies, Bone Club and Bone Meringue. As delightful as those names are, a reminder that those bones are of its dead mother. Seriously, this is some Edgar Allan Poe level stuff right here. Cubone has a decent HP and attack stat, but really comes into its own in terms of defense. These things are very resilient, which combined with their ability to learn powerful moves and the fact that they can perform the HM strength makes them quite the ally. Hopefully you'll be able to win lots of money with them in battle in order to pay for all the therapy you'll need once you've been exposed to Cubone's tragic history. Imagine wearing your mum's skull as a hat. Psychopath behavior, that is. Number 89. Gloom. No, I'm not describing my mood based on the last entry. Gloom is genuinely the name of a Pokémon. The evolved form of Oddish, Gloom, in universe at least, is famous for being stinky. Not in terms of its abilities, but literally, this thing reeks. Apparently one out of 1,000 people enjoy sniffing its nose-bending stink. Hopefully they make Pokeballs with built-in air fresheners. Gloom carries over its baby form's previous moves, which include all of those annoying status-changing ones we mentioned earlier, and it can still learn the likes of Petal Dance and Solar Beam at a very high level. Unfortunately, it doesn't learn any new moves from leveling up, which is a shame, but at least you can still terrorize your enemies by putting all of their fighters to sleep. It gets a decent stat boost from Oddish, but nothing spectacular, and they're still regular enough in the wild to be considered a little bit dull, but Gloom is an improvement and will do you well if you're after a grass type. If you are going to add one to your party, however, make sure you buy plenty of Febreze at the Pokemart. Number 88. Ponita. Whoa! This horse is on fire! See, that joke also works with Alicia Keys' Girl on Fire, but I'm still too scarred from the Borderlands 3 ending to talk about that song. Ponita, a fiery filly that brings a whole new meaning to the phrase hot to trot, gives a decent account of itself as an unevolved beast. Its HP and defenses are alright, and its base attack stat is mightily impressive, making this noble steed even nobler. Find one at the Pokémon Mansion and you've got yourself a powerhouse capable of picking up the incredibly potent Fire Blast T. Although its natural moveset is limited in terms of strong fire moves. Ember? Who the hell wants that? I've burnt myself more getting things out of the oven. Rubbish. Minor gripes aside, considering how easy it is to get one and how much attack strength they have, Ponita is a nice option for players chasing down a fire type to take on any bug or grass type enemies. Who knows? If you train it up well enough, Ponita could end up becoming your main Pokemon. Sorry. Sorry. I'll rein in the horse puns. That's the hoof. I mean, the truth. I need help. Number 87. Porygon. Oh good, another controversial Pokemon, only this time for its appearance in the anime. Episode 38 of the Pokemon TV show, which was called Deno Senshi Porygon, or Electric Soldier Porygon in English, was pulled from broadcast after the flashing lights used by the animators reportedly caused over 600 Japanese children to have seizures. As a result, it has never been aired again, and these blocky beasts have been banished from the anime outside of a few brief cameos. Thankfully, the game version of Porygon has never tried to murder anybody that we uh, know of. These Pokémon are very odd, as they were designed by humans via computer coding, a comment on genetic engineering in animals. They're a normal type, but can become the same type as their opponent through the move Conversion. Porygon can use several Psychic-type attacks as well, plus it can be taught Electric and Ice-type moves via TM. If they were available in more locations than just the Rocket Game Corner, we might have been tempted to put this fascinating creation higher up the list, but its relative rarity confines it to a highly respectable mid-table finish instead. And remember, it did cause serious harm to 600 children, which is uh, a hard thing to look past. Number 86. Nidorina. Considering that there were 23 places between the two forms of Nidoran, 
and the fact that their evolved forms are only six spots apart goes to show how much of a glow up the male Nidoran had. Nidorina, the female form second stage with a disappointingly unned Flanders name, also evolves at level 16 and, just like the previous stage, has better HP and defense stats than its male version. The difference between the two sexes are much less stark than before, which is great for Nidorino but terrible for me and other internet commentators because it's quite hard to find anything new to say about Nidorina. It's still good to level up, still has an alright roster of normal and poison type moves, and it still, very annoyingly, can't learn any HMs. Furthermore, Nidorina doesn't have the interesting tidbit of being involved in the very first anime battle, so I can't even talk about that. In short, it's just a very solid Pokémon that's really rather similar to, but slightly better than, the male version, and that's about all I can say on the matter. Now, please let me move on with my life, because I am absolutely sick of talking about Pokémon that resemble rodents. Number 85. Raticate. Oh, you son of a Professor Bert. Get your Rattata to level 20 and you'll have yourself a Raticate, its larger, fluffier, rounder evolved form. Alongside all those things, Raticate is far more menacing than its purple ancestor, its eyes permanently fixed in a death stare whilst bearing those absolutely gargantuan teeth. Imagine how many wires that thing would chew through if it ever got into your walls. Though it gets a significant attack boost, making it one of the most powerful Pokémon we've come across so far in that category, Raticate still suffers from the curse of being a normal type. By its very definition, the word normal means uninteresting and plain, and that's precisely what this big fuzzy pest is. Think of this Pokémon as a ham sandwich. If you're hungry and in a pinch, it will get the job done no problem at all, but if you had the choice to go with something else, something with a little more spice and pizzazz, then chances are you're going to choose that in instead. Apologies to any just ham sandwich enthusiasts out there, but come on, you know exactly what I mean. At least stick a bit of mustard on it, you know? Live a little. Number 84. Raichu. For the first and only time on this list, we're coming to a Pokémon's evolved form before we reach the one that came before it. I bet you'll never work out why we've done that. Before we take a peek, right? Yeah? Uh-huh. At what this creature evolves from, let's talk about the big electric mouse Pokémon Raichu, who appears through the use of a Thunderstone. It comes equipped with a tasty attack stat, which makes up for the fact that it can only learn three different moves without special help. Three? I can do more moves than that! As well as lacking in move variety and needing an expensive stone to get, Raichu's biggest sin is that it simply isn't its previous form. A huge deal was made in the anime about Ash not evolving his beloved companion, instantly making Raichu a villain in the eyes of children up and down the land. It doesn't help that that particular Raichu was a total bully. Pick on someone your own size, you long-tailed meanie! Honestly, for the cost of a Thunderstone, the upgrade isn't that great, even with the attack bonus. What a trainer will gain in power, they will lose in style, and isn't that the most important thing anyway? Number 83. Bulbasaur. Oh yeah, here we go, starter time! I've chosen a starter Pokémon before, but oh, hang on, that's the wrong catchphrase. <coughs> Excuse me. Before a red or blue player does anything else in their Pokémon journey, they will have to decide between three different potential companions to accompany them on their quest to conquer Kanto. Through thick and thin, rain or shine, sickness and health, these creatures will be there with a the player every step of the way, until they discover cooler Pokémon later on in the game. And even then, maybe not. The Grass-type starter and the very first entry into the very first Pokédex is Bulbasaur, who is just delightful. A happy little dinosaur with a seed on its back, Bulby is a great introduction to Grass-types and is the best choice out of the three starters to face the first two Kanto gym leaders, Rock-type Brock and Water-type Misty. Sadly, this is where the advantages end, as Bulbasaur finishes behind its contemporaries in terms of overall stats, plus it can only learn one HM whilst the others can manage two. At the end of the day, who cares? Bulbasaur is literally the number one Pokémon, and that's something that can never be taken away from it. Number 82. Charmander. Anime lovers will know Charmander as the Pokémon that Ash and Friends rescued from certain death after its original owner left it to die on a rock in the middle of a rainstorm. Have I already mentioned how unsuitable Pokémon is for kids? Feels like I've said that about a hundred times now. The Fire-type starter, Charmander is the most powerful of the three in terms of base attack, but the weakest when it comes to HP and defense. Why is it above Bulbasaur then? Firstly, because it's a lizard with a flaming tail, how cool is that? And secondly, because of the frankly insane number of TMs it can learn. 
Charmander can learn the poisonous toxic move, the earth moving dig, three different fighting type moves, and something called Dragon Rage. Now, I don't know a lot about dragons, but I think the last thing you would want them to do is get into a rage. Though the numbers might be a little off-putting, don't count Charmander out because this fiery reptile is full of surprises. Additionally, when it comes to final forms, we all know what this guy is capable of, and that is a very tantalising prospect indeed. Number 81. Squirtle. Yes, according to our research, water type and sunglasses wearing badass Squirtle is the best of the three Kanto starters, ending a debate that has raged on in the gaming community for three decades. Pl put the brick down, please, don't throw it at me. Despite having a very uncomfortable word in its name, that being tall, Squirtle is an incredibly handy Pokemon to have as it can learn two highly valuable HMs, Strength and Surf. What's more, even though it has the lowest base attack out of the three starters, it more than makes up for that with its staggeringly high defense defense points, which are leaps and bounds ahead of Bulbasaur's and Charmander's. As for gym leaders, the Soggy Turtle is a very valuable ally in taking down Brock, helping to get the very first Kanto Hurdle out of the way nice and easily. Take that, Brock! That'll teach you to leer at all those nurse joys. It's Squirtle's defensive stat that really puts it above the other two, but honestly, your preferred starter will likely come down to which one you picked first as a kid. All three hold a vital place in the Pokémon universe, as well as a special place in the hearts of millions of games the world over. Number 80. Pikachu. Here it is. The mascot of the whole billion dollar franchise, the most important mouse since Mickey, the face that launched a thousand t-shirts, colouring books, backpacks and memes, the happy clappy zappy chappy. It's Pikachu. Designed by Game Freak employee Atsuko Nishida, Pikachu won the hearts and minds of Pokemon fans across the globe as the ever-faithful companion to Ash Ketchum in the various anime series. This led to the release of Pokemon Yellow two years after Red and Blue, which allowed players to follow in Ash's footsteps as the owner of a boisterous electric rodent. The thing about Pikachu is that, in the games, it's actually not that good. Its stats are low and it can't learn any HMs other than Flash, but that's not the point, is it? Everyone who has ever played a Pokemon game has wanted to catch one because it is simply the most famous pocket monster ever created. Even after all this time, this is the only Pokemon most non-gamers have ever heard of, apart from Hamilton, of course, as Pikachu has transcended the medium and entered into the mainstream of popular culture. Yes, there are more powerful options out there, but Pikachu is, and always will be, an icon. Also, Fat Pikachu for life. Number 79. Electabuzz. Keeping things electrical for now, we have Electabuzz, initially a standalone Pokémon that would receive both an evolved and pre-evolved form in later games. You can find one of these by spending some time in the power plant, which in lore provides it with the electricity it needs to stay alive. Actually, I should say that you can find an Electabuzz at the power plant in red, as this is yet another character that doesn't appear in the blue version of the game. More like BOO version, am I right? Yes. This rarity, plus the fact that Electabuzz is quite hard to catch, puts a black mark against this Pokémon's name. Yes, the stats are nice, but they're not quite good enough to overcome the hassle caused by either traipsing around a power plant all day or begging your friend with a copy of the other game to give you one. Please. I'll give you my lunch money all week. It may look the part with its striking design, but there are too many things holding it back for us to wholeheartedly recommend it. Electabuzz is, ironically, a bit of a buzzkill. Number 78. Dragonair. It may sound like a low-cost airline that's definitely going to lose your luggage, but Dragonair is actually the first evolved form of Dratini. Essentially a longer version of its precursor with a little horn in the middle of its face, Dragonair cannot be found in the wild at all in red or blue, leaving players no choice but to get their Dratinis up to level 30 in order to add one to their collections. Fun fact, whilst Dratini is 1.8 meters tall, Dragonair is a whopping 4 meters tall! That's what I call a growth spurt. Once this is done, trainers will be rewarded with a 20 20 point stat boost in all major areas, although no new moves can be learned by leveling up, presumably as Dragonair has wings instead of ears and can't hear any of your commands. Anyone got a pokey hearing aid handy? If they were easier to get hold of and came with more exciting moves, then we might have ranked Dragonair a little higher. Still, the entire Dragon type arc in Red and Blue is super cool, so all of its members instantly get a boost in terms of desirability. Number 77. Grimer. I wanted to make a joke here about the grime genre of music, but then I realise that I am not nearly hip nor with it enough to do that, so I'll pass. Also, I don't actually know anything about grime music. 
Instead, let's chat about Grimer, a Pokémon made out of sludge that can be located in the dark recesses of the Pokémon Mansion, presumably next to where they used to keep the bins. This is a really nice and simple design that gets across that this poison type will leave you with a nasty illness if you get too close. But how does Grimy hold up on the battlefield? Quite well, actually, as it comes equipped with strong HP and attack stats as well as an arsenal of devastating poison moves designed to inflict untold misery on opposing players. Grimer is a little less powerful than the previous two Pokémon we've chatted about, but it's got a better balance of stats and is much easier to find than either Electabuzz or Dragonair. If you want to balance attack strength with availability, then Grimer is your man, or woman, or whatever the hell a sludgy monster is. Do Grimers even have sexes? How do you check? Actually, don't answer that. I know there's probably deviant art out there already. Number 76. Pidgeotto. Though this Pokémon starts out life as a Pidgey, anime fans will have first gotten to know one as Pidgeotto, as that's the stage at which Ash first caught one. Pidgey only needs to get to level 18 to make the change happen as it evolves from a bird into a slightly bigger bird. Wow! Considering how easy it is to get a Pidgey and how low its evolution level is, chances are most Kanto players will have used a Pidgeotto in their time. If you don't fancy raising one, then wild Pidgeottos can be found on routes 14, 15, 21, and sitting atop any electrical lines you might come across. Just make sure you don't stand under them for too long. They might drop some Squidgeotos on you. <laughs> Though weaker than some creatures below it in this list, Pidgeotto gets a pass for being so instrumental to a player's journey throughout the region, and for that all important fly ability. Honestly, if you've ever tried to play the latter stages of any Pokémon game without learning fly, then you'll know just how painful it is. Bird is most definitely the word when it comes to this evolutionary line, and we're still not done with it yet. Number 75. Starmie. Star U evolves into Star Me, which sadly does not then evolve into Star Them to complete this grammatical line. Another member of Misty's arsenal in the anime, Star Me is literally double trouble for anything it comes up against, as it seems to have a second star growing out the back of it that can rotate at high speeds, making it a fierce warrior and helpful in the kitchen too. Imagine how quickly Starmie could get all the dishes done with that many arms. A dream come true. As well as gaining an extra body, it also gains an extra attribute, as this is a part water, part psychic type creature. This makes it doubly powerful against fighting and poison types, but ineffective against dark types. However, seeing as dark types didn't exist when Starmie first showed up, we're not allowed to hold that fact against it. Starmie is let down by its evolutionary requirements, though, as it can only come into being via a water stone, which are both rare and expensive. It's got a lot of good qualities, though, including the ability to learn Surf and Flash, so this beefed-up version of Patrick from SpongeBob gets a gold star from us. Number 74. Seedra. If you're looking for a water-type evolution that doesn't require a magical rock, then look no further than Seedra, which is what happens when you get horsey up to level 32. Oh man, level 32? That sounds like so much effort! Can't I just fight using a real seahorse instead? In contrast to their starry counterpart, Seedra can be found native in the wild, either on the Seafoam Islands or by using a super rod on Route 23 and in the Cerulean Cave. Manage to snag one, and you'll find that the crazy high defense stat of its lesser form has only gotten higher. Seedra is an underwater brick wall with a very high base defense and a fairly respectable HP stat to boot. It's not got the best attack in the world, but if paired up with the right opponent, it could do some serious damage. If you want to compare the Horsey and Staryu lines based on numbers, then the latter just about comes out on top. But as we mentioned earlier, it's way more tedious to get a Starmie, so Seedra is definitely the way to go if you're in the mood for some aquatic adventure. Adventures. Number 73. Firo. Spiro may have lost out to Pidgey in the Battle of the Stage 1 Birds, but we just couldn't deny how much of a boss its second form is. Evolving at the slightly higher level of 20, Firo definitely lives up to its name, sporting a gigantic beak pointy enough to make even the most hardened of trainers wet the bed. I wouldn't worry too much though, as according to the Pokedex, if it senses danger, it flies high and away instantly a Pokémon after my own heart. I'm not sure why it would need to run away, as Firo has an attack stat that means it can tangle with the best of them. With the powerful flying move Drill Peck up its feathery sleeve, this aerial threat can rain punishment down on any unsuspecting foe, and if that's not enough, you can teach it Sky Attack via TM. It might not sound like much, but it's strong, believe me. Pidgeotto may be the more iconic bird, but Firo packs way too much of a punch to be below it. However, at least Pidgeotto can take comfort in the fact that it's not a coward. Number 72. Magmar. 
According to later Pokedex entries, Magmar is one of the leading causes of forest fires in the Pokemon universe, which is surely worth docking at a few points here, right? Thankfully, it makes up for its tendency to do a arson by looking absolutely cool as hell. A flame-covered body with a fiery tail and sharp claws Yes, please. Though, do ignore the fact that the thing on its forehead does look a lot like a bum. A blue exclusive creature, which makes no sense considering that red is the fire colour, Magmar can be located in Pokemon Mansion or traded over if you foolishly bought the other version of the game. It can learn strength, which is never a bad thing, and it has some quite decent HP and defence stats, as well as boasting the highest base attack power of any Pokemon we've seen so far on this list. The only major drawback is that it's much harder to get a hold of than other fire types, as even in blue, it's got a relative low catch rate and can only be found in one location. If you do manage to get your mitts on one, then honestly, good for you. Just remember to install sprinklers in its Pokeball in case anything goes wrong, yeah? Number 71. Tangela. This grass type is known as the Vine Pokemon, which unfortunately doesn't mean that it can only communicate in six second video clips. R.I.P. Vine, you were too beautiful for this world. Tangler is apparently based on the severed head of Medusa, although it sadly doesn't come with the ability to turn opponents to stone. It gained an evolution called Tangrowth in Generation 4, but was a one and done in Gen 1, although it's really all you need. What it lacks in HP and attack, which it has a relatively small amount of, it more than makes up for in defense, boasting one of the highest numbers of any unevolved Pokemon in that particular area. I suppose all the attacks must get caught up in its various messy vines? Like Christmas lights tangling up with all the other decorations in the box, bloody things. You can get a Tangler in the Pokemon Lab on Cinnabar Island by trading a Venonat, which is a huge upgrade if you ask me, and you can also find them in the wild on Route 21. Though they're going to be rather useless against fire types, this mysterious creature has a lot going for it, even if it's a gardener's worst nightmare. Number 70. Hypno. Here's what happens if you get a drowsy up to level 26. It loses some girth around its midriff, gets pointier ears, and finds a coin type thing on a piece of string. Are those naturally occurring? If so, then how? You know what, maybe those aren't the important questions. As its name suggests, Hypno loves nothing more than to use its special accessory to put unsuspecting travelers to sleep. It's based on the Baku, a species of mythical Japanese tapirs that are said to feast on people's nightmares. Oh, good. I forgot how creepy this line of evolution was, just when I'd stopped wetting the bed as well. Like its equally terrifying younger state, Hypno is also a psychic type, which limits the number of creatures it's effective against. You can either evolve a drowsy or find one living in Cerulean Cave, because of course this little weirdo hangs out in a dark, dingy underground cavern. It's not all bad news for Hypno, as it's actually quite well balanced in terms of stats. Nothing amazing, just evenly solid, which makes it a lot more all-weather than some of its contemporaries. Nevertheless, it is based on a nightmare-eating monster, which is just unpleasant, no matter how you slice it. Number 69. Nice! Slowpoke. It is apparently common for slowpokes to dip their tail into water in an attempt to catch prey, only to forget what they were doing and just sit there all day long. Honestly, it's just shocking how much I have in common with so many different Pokemon. Though it can learn psychic type moves like Confusion and Amnesia, Slowpoke is also half water type, meaning that you can use these dopey critters to surf your way around Kanto to your heart's delight. What's more, it can pick up the HM Strength and Flash too, making it a real Swiss Army Pokemon if ever there was one. They're available fairly regularly throughout the game, usually in areas close to or in water, and have a nice amount of HP, which is a good thing for a Pokemon that is so dim-witted that it sometimes doesn't even know it's being attacked. As well as being incredibly useful, Slowpoke's dawdling nature is also highly endearing, as you can't help but root for a creature that spends most of its time having no clue what's going on. It may have the word slow in its name, but this Pokemon will quickly become one of your favourites. Number 68. Onyx. Onyx is a rock and ground type Pokemon that can grow to heights of uh, hang on a second. 8.8 .8 meters? I think I'm going to need a bigger bed for it. The Rock Snake is the tallest of all the inhabitants of the Kanto region and is one of the biggest Pokemon of all time. Despite its hulking size, the species is also very nippy, being able to travel underground at speeds of 50 miles per hour. Just imagine one of these hurtling towards you. You'd lose your lunch in no time. Enormous as it may be, Onyx has some seriously fatal flaws in its design, namely that it has a lower base HP than a Weedle and a lower base attack than Diglett. So you're telling me that in a straight fight, a Diglett would kick an Onyx's bouldery backside? Pull the other one, Game Freak. If you want impressive stats, then Onyx does have those, as its base defense is the second highest of any Pokemon in all of Gen 1. That's the primary reason it's this high up the list, but it's also just really cool to look at. Plus, Brock had one in the anime, which certainly doesn't hurt its case. 
Number 67. Hitmonlee Though it takes its English name from martial arts legend Bruce Lee, Hitmonlee's appearance is based on the Headless Men, mythical hominids from Greek and Roman folklore. Just look at these guys. Simultaneously the funniest and most disconcerting thing I've ever seen. Hitmon Lee looks much better by comparison with its devilish, sunken eyes, vicious looking talons and legs that go for miles. Fwaaaaa! It's a fighting type if you hadn't already worked that out, and can only be found in one specific place on the Kanto map. This Pokemon can be won as a prize by completing the Fighting Dojo, an unofficial gym in Saffron City led by the mystical Karate Master. Beat him, and you'll be offered either a Hitmon Lee or a very similar Pokemon. More on that later. Although it mainly attacks with its legs, its moveset includes maneuvers such as rolling kick, job kick, high job kick, burger kick, bob 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 bobs. Plus, this creature packs an almighty punch, or kick, with one of the best attack stats in the whole game. Although it can't be caught in the wild, it's fairly simple to take down the dojo, making Hitmonlee an accessible powerhouse for if you ever need to absolutely clobber somebody. Number 66. Charmeleon. Evolving a starter is one of any Pokemon game's great joys. Seeing your first ever companion blossom into a stronger version of itself is a reminder of not only how far it's come, but how far you've come as a player. With that in mind, let's talk about the worst of the three starters. Whilst Charmander has a certain nostalgic quality to it, its evolved form Charmeleon gets no such bias, so we have to judge it based on stats alone. Once Charmander reaches level 16, it fleshes out a bit more, gains a meaner expression and gets a stat boost that can best be described as modest. This new form can learn a few more moves, but none in the fire department, which is kind of its whole thing. Instead, it has to contend with having the worst base HP and defensive stats of any of the three starters' second stage evolutions, and whilst it does have the highest attack, it's only by a single point. Think of Charmeleon as the awkward teenage phase of its line. Yes, it's a bit spottier than it used to be and it's struggling to finish its maths A-level, but better things are on the horizon. Number 65. Ivysaur Bulbasaur might have lost the battle to Charmander, but in terms of evolved forms, it's Ivysaur that has the upper hand. Get your beloved Bulby to level 16 and you'll have it replaced with a bigger, leafier version doing its best to look serious while still being very cuddleable. Despite appearing in numerous episodes of Pokemon TV shows over the years, an Ivysaur has never been shown to lose a battle. Does this fact transfer over to the games? No, but we thought it was an interesting little tidbit nonetheless. It was a close call between this and Charmeleon, but Ivysaur pips Charmeleon to the post in in terms of stats, although it would definitely lose to one in combat based on type advantages. It can learn a more powerful grass type move, Razor Leaf, and it's just that little bit more desirable, which might be because Charmeleon was only ever shown in the anime to be a right grumpy sod. This decision could have gone either way, as these two second stage starters were so close, but one thing that's for certain is that the second stage evolution of the third of Professor Oak's options blows it out of the water. Not literally though. Number 64. Beedrill. You thought it was going to be War Turtle, didn't you? Psych! We won't actually be seeing one of those for ages. For now, you'll have to settle for Beedrill, which you may have forgotten all about as we haven't mentioned its evolutionary line for quite some time. Beedrill is the final form of Weedle, evolving from Kakuna at level 10. It is the mirror image Pokemon of Butterfree, which might have the emotional advantage, but when it comes to cold hard numbers, it gets its little butterfly ass handed to it by the giant bee every time. Butterfree has a higher defense stat than its opposite number, Number, but only just, and in terms of other stats, it doesn't stand a chance. Beedrill benefits massively from a very high base attack stat, which is nearly twice as high as the Caterpie final form. Although, despite the fact that it's a poison type, it can only learn one poison move, and that is by TM. What a con. Still, considering how easy it is to catch and evolve a Weedle and how good the reward is, Beedrill gets a big thumbs up from us. Sadly, it can't give us one back because it has cones for hands. After all, everybody knows that's Big Dick B. Number 63. Weepin' Bell. Remember Bellsprout from further down the list? Well, it's back and looking even more surprised than before. It looks like me that time I walked in on James recreating the spaghetti moment from Lady and the Tramp with a cardboard cutout of Danny DeVito. What? No? We don't have the footage for that? Oh, you just have to imagine it then. At level 21, Bellsprout turns into Weepin' Bell, another dual grass and poison Pokemon which can be found in the wilds on routes 12, 13, 14 and 15. Well, if you have blue instead of red, but we've already covered that. As well as being bigger in size than its original build, Weepin' Bell is also better in every way, packing higher stats, including a very strong attack number for a Pokemon without limbs. It can learn more advanced grass and poison type moves than Bellsprout, and it can carry over all those annoying status changes from before. 
Hooray! 21 might be a fairly high level for evolution, but this fabulous flora can be found in the wild relatively easily, bypassing the need for any grind whatsoever. Considering it can also learn the vitally important HM cut, this would be a welcome addition to any trainer's garden. Also, it doubles up as a fly catcher too, which is useful for removing indoor pests, like James. Number 62, Lickitung. Oh good, another Pokemon that licks people. If this and Haunter are your favourite Pokemon, then you know what you're about, and we salute you. Apparently, the tongue of a Lickitung can extend out to 6 feet and 6 inches in length, which is one of many reasons why I'm glad Pokemon don't exist in the real world. It cannot be found in the wild in red or blue, but rather the only way to get one is to trade a Slowbro with an NPC on Route 18. You can see why they were trying to get rid of it, that tongue is really quite horrifying. Menacing muscle to one side though, Lickitung does come with a very nice base HP score, as well as a reasonable stat in defence. Being a normal type, its moveset isn't all that thrilling, but this does make it very versatile, and it's able to learn the HMs, Cut, Strength, and Surf. It might appear a little dull on the outside, not to mention a bit creepy, but there's more to this Pokemon than just licking. Although its evolved form in future games is called Licky Licky. You just don't help yourself, do you, Lickitung? Number 61, Hitmonchan. If you don't fancy a kicking Pokemon after you've defeated the Karate Master at the Fighting Dojo, then you can always choose this guy, a boxing Pokemon named after Jackie Chan, who, who isn't a boxer, right? Whilst they would originally exist as separate entities, Hitmonlee and Hitmonchan were later retconned to evolve from the same base Pokemon. This, plus the fact that they can both be obtained in the dojo, makes them ripe for comparison. And unfortunately for all the Enter the Dragon fans out there, Rush Hour comes out on top. Hitmonchan is a fighting type too, only this time with a punch-heavy moveset. Unlike Hitmonlee, this Pokemon's moves are more varied, including the normal type Comet Punch, the electric type Thunder Punch, and the ice type Ice Punch. That's three distinctive moves right there, making Hitmonchan a useful tool for overcoming a variety of enemies. Whilst it doesn't boast its brother's massive attack power, this gloved fighter does have a much higher defense number, which as any boxing coach will tell you, is just as important. For all the reasons we've just stated then, you are much better off picking this prize once you conquer the former Saffron City Gym. Number 60, Wigglytuff. With the help of a Moonstone, Jigglypuff evolves into Wigglytuff. Then in Gen 2, they introduced a pre-evolved form of Jigglypuff called Igglybuff. You've got to hand it to them, that is one of the most consistently named evolutionary lines in all of Pokemon. Much like how Jigglypuff's high HP was let down by a measly defense stat, Wigglytuff also suffers from an imbalance, although both of those numbers are an improvement on what they once were. The HP figure is particularly formidable, actually, as it's the third highest in the whole game. And Wiggles also comes equipped with a tasty attack number too, so it's not a total washout in the stats department. Here's the kicker though, if you catch a wild Wiggly in the Cerulean Cave, then you'll be stuck with the same four moves for its entire lifespan. It can't learn anything new except via TM or HM, meaning the most powerful attack it knows is, and always will be, Double Slap. <laughs> More like a double slap in the face if you ask me. Thankfully though, if you get your Wigglytuff by evolving your Jigglypuff, then it will carry over all of its old moves. If it wasn't for this, Wigglytuff would have been much further down this list. Number 59, Clefable. Much like with our aforementioned Wiggly friend, if you give a Clefairy a Moonstone, you only get a slightly bigger version of Clefairy with pointier ears. Oh, what an upgrade! Clefable doesn't just get bulkier in size, but its stats also flesh out a bit too. Whilst Clefairy had the battling capabilities of a small rabbit, its evolved form is a lot harder to take down, with a nice big well of HP to draw on, and moderately impressive attack and defense numbers. They're not mind-blowing by any stretch, but they're much better than what came before. 
Of all the evolutionary stones in Gen 1, the Moonstone is by far the easiest to find. These lunar rocks can be located on Route 2, in Mount Moon, in the Team Rocket hideout, and at the Pokemon Mansion, giving players plenty of opportunities to grab one and rub it all over their Clefairy until it grows up. At least, I, I think that's how stones work in Pokemon. This gives Clefable an advantage over other Pokemon that need a fire or water stone to evolve, for example, as those are only available in one shop for a high price, whilst Moonstones are effectively free. And you all know that we here at Triple Jump just can't resist a bargain. Number 58. Omastar it's impossible to look at an Omastar with its flailing limbs, wild eyes, and open mouth, and not imagine it going <laughs> straight at you. Go on, try it. I'll wait. The evolved form of Omanyte, Omastar, comes around when a player gets their former fossil to level. Hang on a second, that can't be right. Level 40? That's a blooming huge number! I can barely be bothered to wait for the microwave to cook some popcorn, let alone this. Whilst it's true that this creature from the deep does have an insanely high evolutionary level, trainers with significantly more patience than I will find the grind they put into getting one to be completely worth it. Whilst Omastar's HP and attack aren't all that, its defense stat is formidable, one of the five highest in the entire game. When you factor in the fact that it can also learn Surf, the powerful Horn Attack, and Supreme Water Move Hydro Pump, this undead snail starts to seem a little more appealing. Unfortunately, though, a combination of disappointing other stats and that mad leveling requirement weighs on the star down. But considering this species technically died out millions of years ago, it's not doing all that badly. Number 57. Kabutops. Whilst Kabuto was several places higher than Omanyte on this list, its evolved form can only manage one better than its soggy equivalent. Also, we take back everything we said about Kabuto being a mushroom, because good grief am I frightened of Kabutops. Look at those pincers! God, they'd rip through me like scissors through wrapping paper. According to the Pokédex, it slashes prey with its claws and drains the bodily fluids, which is gross, but also makes it one hell of an ally in battle. It's got a killer combo of base attack and defense, both of which are in the hundreds, a rare feat in Gen 1, although its measly base HP of 60 really lets the side down. It can, however, learn both Surf and Cut, that last one not being surprising. Then again, for all its positives, Kabutop suffers from one of the same issues as Omastar. It's a nightmare to get hold of. Not only do players need to get the Dome Fossil, which will block them from getting the Helix one, but they also then need to get Kabuto up to level 40, which, as we said in the previous entry, is a pain in the prehistoric backside. You look great, Kabutops, but you're just too much hard work. Number 56, Arbok. You're not going to believe this, but remember Ekans from earlier, the snake Pokemon that if you reverse its name spells snake? Well, the evolved form, Arbok, looks like a cobra, and guess what? Its name, spelled backwards, is Cobra! Except, wait, Cobra is spelt with a C and not a K. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's spelling errors. I'll get you for this game, freak. Oh, oh, do you spell freak F-R-E-A-C? <laughs> no, no, I didn't think so. Wonky name notwithstanding, Arbok's every bit as badass as it looks. It's got a decent attack stat of 80 and a very nice defense stat of 69. Which isn't huge in the grand scheme of things, but when you take into account that this evolves from such a weedy previous form, the glow up is mightily impressive. Furthermore, said glow up happens at the relatively low level 22, which is a welcome change from some of the dizzyingly high levels we've spoken about recently. Arbok can also be found relatively easily in the wild, and can learn the useful HM strength, giving this ravenous reptile a strong leg to stand on. Well, metaphorically speaking, because it doesn't actually have any legs. Should I not have pointed that out? Have I just upset the entire snake community? S sorry about that. Ukulele apology video coming soon. Number 55, War Tortle. Finally, we've reached the third of three of our Stage 2 starter Pokémon. Up your game, Ivysaur and Charmeleon. War Tortle is putting you both to shame. 
The midpoint of the Squirtle series sits in between its counterparts in both base HP and attack stats, but like its first form, its defense really gives it the edge. Thanks to its tough outer shell, Wartortle has a significantly higher resilience factor than its two friends, boosting its overall points total significantly and taking it well clear of the fire and grass types. You could argue that Charmeleon is more recognizable because Ash had one in the anime, but the truth is, none of the second stages of the Kanto starters are particularly notable in that regard. To get bonus points for making up a third of all players' Pokemon experiences, but on the TV show, they're all sorely underrated, meaning we have to base their rankings on cold hard facts. Wartortle can learn Strength and Surf, which are both hugely helpful in traversing the map, and when you crunch the numbers, it comes out way ahead. Will this Water-type dominance continue when we reach round 3? Oh, watch on and find out. Number 54, Ninetales. According to Pokey Legend, Ninetales was formed when nine noble saints were resurrected by a wizard and combined into a single spirit, which is easily one of the most badass backstories of any of the original 151. Instead of having to bring nine people back from the dead in the game, though, players can get a Ninetales much more easily by giving a Firestone to Vulpix and watching it evolve. This will result in a truly majestic creature based on a Huli Jing, a many-tailed Chinese spirit in the shape of a fox that actually makes an appearance in the Marvel film Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Does that technically make this Pokemon a superhero? No, not at all. Why would you even suggest that? With a solid set of stats and the ability to learn the high-powered flamethrower move through evolution, Ninetales is only really let down by something we've already talked about. Those darn stones. Firestones can only be bought at the Celadon department store, and they are not cheap, let me tell you. And, in truth, of the three Pokemon that need one to evolve, this fabulous fox is the least desirable. Oh well, at least it will always have its looks. Number 53, Machop. It might look small and innocent, as well as only being stage one of a three-stage evolution, but don't be fooled, Machop is a cold-hearted killer. The Pokedex states that this fighting type's body is entirely composed of muscles, which is something we both have in common, <laughs> and that it can hurl 100 adult humans without getting tired. Now that's where we differ. My record is 107. As it's a fighting type, Machop's attack strength is pretty phenomenal, but there's more to this little fella than pure power. It's got a nice batch of HP and a decent reserve of defense points. But here's the real kicker, or puncher if you will, Machops are so easy to find. Compared with other creatures with similar stats, Machop is much more common and therefore far easier to add to your party. Whilst it can only be found in two places, one of which is Victory Road right at the end of the story, if a player spends enough time there, they will walk away with one of these punch-happy chaps in their possession. There are stronger Pokemon for sure, but few can match Machop match, match op, in terms of potency and popularity. Number 52, Tentacruel. If you're a fan of tentacles, not like that, although maybe a bit like that, then you'll love this next entry. Whilst Tentacool only has a measly two protrusions, its evolved form, Tentacruel, has more than I can count, which is to say it has more than three. Once leveled up to 30, Tentacool goes through a serious attitude adjustment, transforming from a mild-mannered squid to a sea creature that wouldn't think twice about slapping you directly in the face. Whilst it would become abundant in the wild in future games, Tentacruel can only be obtained in Gen 1 via evolution which we would hold against it, but we're too scared of getting a slapping. To be honest, this really isn't the end of the world, as Tentacool are fairly easy to catch, even if level 30 is a bit of an ache in the ink sack to reach. Tentacruel is also fairly consistent in its stats, with no real weaknesses to speak of. It might not be the most exciting Pokemon in the world, but it can also be used to chop down trees and float on top of clear blue water, making it a very handy Neocoleoidea indeed. That's a real word, look it up. Number 51, Sandshrew. 
Another pre-evolved pal now, and one that would make a really fun pet were it not made entirely out of harsh, unforgiving stone. Sandshrew is a shrew, and it lives in the sand. It really is as simple as that. Well, unless you own a copy of Red instead of Blue, because guess what? It's another Blue exclusive. An exclusive, if you will. <laughs> Wait, why is it taking us this long to say exclusive? That's great. If you are lucky enough to own the C-coloured copy of Gen 1, though, then you are in for a real treat with this one, as Sandshrew packs an almighty punch for having such a small body. I can relate. Even though its base HP isn't that great, its other key stats are seriously stunning, especially for a Mon with such a high catch rate and one that's available in so many different locations. Again, that's in blue only. Sorry, Red players, I suppose you'll have to do what Nintendo wants you to do, and buy both. Sandshrew can also learn Strength and Cut, as well as the possible status changer Poison Sting. And honestly, the more I talk about this rocky rodent, the more I like it. Good on you, Sandshrew. Number 50. Primate. In some genius attention to detail on Game Freak's part, Mankey has a tail, whilst its evolved form, Primate, doesn't. This is because almost all species of monkey have a tail, whilst everything technically classed as an ape does not. Ah, see? People say these videos aren't educational. Even without an extra limb, though, Primate is not to be messed with, as this fighting type dishes out even more punishment than the one that came before it. It can learn a whole host of strong attacks, including Seismic Toss, which damages the opponent more if it's a higher level. Plus, it isn't affected by damage immunities, so it can be used on ghost types, which should teach those pesky poltergeists a thing or two. <laughs> Try and haunt me, will ya? Level 28 isn't too bad for an evolution, and Primeape also comes with an acceptable attack and defense base, as well as the ability to receive the HM Strength. It's a red exclusive, which does knock it down a peg or two, but we're not going to let that affect its rating too much. Also, I am absolutely terrified of it. Primeape looks like it would wring me out like a wet towel without a second thought, and I am not willing to put that theory to the test. L let's move on, shall we? Number 49, Geodude. Do you like rocks? Do you like arms? Do you like dudes? Well then, by golly, are you going to love this next entry? Also, if that is you, that's a really weird combination of things to get excited about. Are you okay? As it turns out, Geodude, or Geodudette, is far more than just a chunk of stone with freakishly large biceps. It's an ass kicking machine. With an insane attack stat of 80 and an even insaner defense stat of 100, Geodude has skills that would make several second or third stage evolutions weep with jealousy. It's one of the most popular and recognizable rock types in all of Pokey history, and also got a starring role in the original anime as one of the go-to soldiers of serial womanizer Brock. This is a Pokemon that's super easy to catch in several mountainous areas of Kanto, and is available in both versions of the game. Granted, it has an HP stat so low that you could trip over it, but when you throw in all of the positives we've just mentioned, that seems like a fair trade-off. And the most exciting thing of all? Geodude is only the first in its line. We'll check in again with this jacked specimen a little later on. Number 48, Krabby. Hmm, said someone at Game Freak. What should we name this Pokemon we've based on a crab? Well, said someone else, you could just stick a Y on the end and change the first letter from a C to a K. And that, I assume, is how Krabby got its moniker. Another 4.30pm on a Friday job, this one. Oh, there's an extra B in there as well, so I suppose there was some effort made. Krabby, a water type modelled on everyone's favourite restaurant-owning Bikini Bottom resident, probably, possibly, is, simply put, a total boss. It has an attack stat of 105, which is the same as the fighting types Hitmonchan and Primeape, and a defense of 90, making it pretty darn difficult to get your fork into this walking seafood dinner. On top of that, it can be found all over the bleeding place in Kanto on the end of a super rod, and plus, with the ability to learn cut, strength, and surf, it's one of the most versatile tools a trainer can add to their collection. 
The only thing letting it down is its pitiful HP, which is less killer crab and more useless sea urchin. But cut the fella some slack, won't you? All this other good stuff, and a fun name, I mean what more could you possibly want from your weird battling pseudo animals? Some people are just too picky, honestly. Number 47, Golbat. Nearly 100 places above its pre-evolved form, Zubat, we find Golbat, a Pokemon that can't seem to shut its giant gaping mouth. A bit like Ashton Matthews. <laughs> Seriously though, imagine all the flies it must accidentally swallow. I am talking about Golbat again now. Although being a bat, it probably wouldn't mind that too much. Get a Zubat to level 22 and this shall be your reward, a much more useful version of the blind cave dweller. Though it suffers from the same issues of not being able to learn fly despite having massive wings, it can still learn as varied a set of TMs and HMs as its smaller form. Plus, it won't get knocked out if a particularly strong gust of wind blows in. Golbat is far from spectacular, don't get me wrong, but it's consistently very good. Think of it as the ready salted crisps of the Pokemon world, the vanilla ice cream, or the Ross from Friends. They're nobody's favourite, but they still come through for you in a pinch. Actually, scratch that last analogy. Ross was an arse, and conversely, vanilla is actually my favourite ice cream flavour, so go figure. Considering how utterly tragic Zubat was, to see it turn into something extremely competent is a real delight. Actually, I'm getting a bit emotional thinking about the journey it's been on, you know? Oh, they grow up so fast. Number 46, Sea King. You can stop your seeking, everyone, because you've seeked your way right to this friendly looking water type. It is seeked the correct conjugation there? Sort, seeken, suck? No, maybe not that last one. Evolving from Goldeen at an eye-popping level 33, Seeking, which is available as both a male and a female despite its misleading name, is 1.3 meters tall and weighs 39 kilograms or 85 pounds for our non-metric viewers. Jeez, imagine trying to land this out of the local canal or carrying it home from the village fate in a plastic bag. That would not end well. It might be a bit of a pain to evolve, but Seeking comes equipped with a strong attack stat plus HP and defense numbers that also aren't too shabby. Furthermore, it comes equipped with Peck, the flying type move, disclaimer, do not attempt to see if your goldfish can fly in real life, and also the move Waterfall, one of the strongest water type attacks in all of Gen 1. Though not the most frightening swimmer in Kanto, Sea King will get the job done for you and look elegant as all get out whilst doing so. God, what I wouldn't give to have a tail fin like that. <laughs> Number 45, Dodrio. Continuing the proud tradition of Pokemon with more than one sentient head, and therefore a very confusing central nervous system, is Dodrio, the three-headed evolved form of Doduo from earlier on. <laughs> Duo, trio, see what they did there with the numbers of heads? Oh, whatever, I thought it was clever. This creature, which is clearly based on a flightless ostrich, can learn fly, whilst Golbat cannot. Somebody make it make sense. Speaking of moves though, Dodrio is one of the few Gen 1 Pokemon that can learn the powerful normal type move, Tri Attack. Wait a second, Doduo can learn Tri Attack as well, even though it's only got two heads. Again, make it make sense. Confusing as all this may be, Dodrio is a significant upgrade that would serve any trainer well, both on the battlefield and in regular gameplay. Another impressive stat is its speed, which pretty much guarantees that it will hit first in a fight, a very useful ability to have. Unfortunately though, this does not translate into the option to ride Dodrio around like some sort of emu-shaped e-scooter. If it did though, you can bet that the Pallet Town Council would come down hard on them. Killjoys, that lot. Number 44, Victory Bell. Though it may have tried to eat Team Rocket's James every time it turned up in the anime, Victory Bell will try not to swallow you if you catch one in either red or blue, and that's a triple jump guarantee. The third and final member of the Bellsprout and Weepin' Bell family, Victory Bell is by far the most powerful poisonous plant we've come across so far. With its strong attack score and a whole host of moves such as Razor Leaf, Acid and Poison Powder, this is a very tough Pokemon to take down. 
well, yes, unless you've got a fire type, but shush you. It might be one of the stronger grass types in the game, but there are some things holding Victory Bell back. And not just the fact that it's confusingly spelled with only one L, whereas Bellsprout and Weeping Bell have two. For a start, it's a blue exclusive, which is annoying, and it can only be obtained by evolving a Weeping Bell via a Leaf Stone, the pitfalls of which we've already discussed at length. Considering they aren't available in the wild, you're going to need an expensive green rock if you want to get your mitts on this furious flytrap. Most people would say it was worth it, though. Unless you're James from Team Rocket. Number 43. Parasect in Pokemon Lore, Parasect is what happens when the parasitic mushroom growing on the back of a Paras fully engulfs the poor bug, taking over its mind and body completely, which is way too The Last of Us for my liking. In the game, you do not need to unleash a potentially world-ending fungus to get one of these, though. All you have to do is evolve Paris at level 24, and you won't even need to call in Pedro Pascal to help. These evolved forms can also be found in the Cerulean Cave or the Safari Zone, making them relatively easy to catch, and with decent stats across the board, it's no bad thing to run into one of these little buggers. Parasect's attack is where it really comes into its own, utilizing its giant pincers to learn moves like Slash, Scratch, and Cut, which all mean roughly the same thing, but are different, I promise. Another modestly successful creature, Parasect is a worthy inclusion for any player who wants to inflict effect damage whilst also having some strong regular moves should the occasion call for it. Just don't think about the fact that an evil mushroom is essentially piloting around an innocent Pokemon's corpse. <laughs> Lovely. Number 42. Rapidash. When designing the evolved form of Ponita, the Fire Horse Pokemon, Game Freak decided the best thing to do would be to add even more fire and even more horse. And guess what? They were right to do both of those things. Rapidash is a mighty stallion, which also has a horn, technically making it a unicorn, and I will hear no arguments about that fact. This blazing black beauty can learn all sorts of powerful fire-type moves, including Ember, Fire Spin, and Fire Blast if you've got the right TM. And with an attack stat of 100, those are all going to cause serious pain. They may not be available in the wild, but that's okay. Just evolve a Ponita. Now let's just see, what level do I need to get it to? 40? Are you joking? Rapidash has the third highest level for evolution in the entire game, which is a huge huge black mark against this otherwise excellent equestrian. Still, if you've got nothing better to do and fancy yourself a Pokemon that can both win you a gym battle and the derby, then this one is your best bet. Have fun dealing with the repetitive strain injury from all that grinding, though. Number 41. Vile Plume. Oddish is very much the red exclusive equivalent of Bellsprout, which makes our friend Vileplume here the flame-coloured games version of Victory Bell, only without any weird spelling to catch you out. Give a leaf stone to a gloom, and this is what you'll get. A happy, smiling, purple thing wearing giant petals on its head as if they were a fashionable hat. This design is based on the real-life Rafflesia plant, a flower famous for both looking and smelling like rotting flesh, but don't let that put you off. Vileplume comes equipped with its predecessor's various status-altering moves, as well as the ability to pick up Solar Beam and Hyper Beam from TMs. If you don't know what those moves are, then imagine a giant ray of death heading straight for you, and you'll get the idea. It may not have the wildly high attack base of Victory Bell, but Vileplume is at least more uniform when it comes to the numbers. Considering both creatures need a stone to evolve and both can only learn Cut as an HM, it was a tough call to decide which one came out on top, but Vileplume's consistency just gave it the edge. Number 40, Dugong. Remember that seal-like Pokemon called Seal from earlier on? Well, meet its evolved form. Its name is Dugong, and it's based on a real-life animal called, oh, uh, surprise, surprise, a Dugong. I can't believe it. They've done it again. How do these people keep getting away with this? Much like with their real-life counterparts, which are similar to manatees but are technically a separate animal, Dugong in the Pokémon world is a sea-dwelling creature that some ancient sailors used to confuse for mermaids. 
Unfortunately though, there is no regional variant of dugong that comes with a clamshell bra. Could you mock one up for us, Alex? Oh, there we go. As expected, it's bad. You'll need to get Seal all the way to level 34 to unlock this friend, which is less than ideal, but all of that effort pays off in the form of a Pokemon that has strong stats across the board. Like its younger self, it too can learn Ice-type attacks like Aurora Beam and Ice Beam, as well as handy HMs such as Surf and Strength. Also, if you want to, you can just catch one naturally in the Seafoam Islands. A solid, dependable Pokemon if ever there was one, Dugong is also, thankfully, the end of its evolutionary line, meaning no more lazily named water types from here on out. Number 39, Flareon. Coming in way ahead of its electric-type equivalent, this Eeveelution has more than earned its fiery reputation. When given a Fire Stone, Eevee will evolve into Flareon, growing a much bigger tail and gaining a cool reddish-orange paint job in the process. As well as learning a number of Fire-type moves like Ember and Flamethrower, Flareon can also be taught TMs such as Double Edge, Hyper Beam, and Rest, which is the only move I would ever use if I were a Pokemon. It may not have the strongest base HP or defense stats, but it's in attack that this adorable arsonist comes into its own. With a staggering score of 130, Flareon has the joint second highest attack in all of Kanto, more than any legendary and on par with several creatures we won't be seeing until much higher up this list. Such a powerful attack doesn't entirely make up for the other two poor stats, but there's no denying just how impressive it is that so much oomph comes from such a little fluffball. It's what we tinies all have in common. Don't get on the wrong side of Flareon or me, otherwise you might just get burned. Number 38, Vaporeon. Though more Eeveelutions would come in later generations, red and blue players had to cope with just three, and our choice for pick of the litter is the water type variation, Vaporeon. When gifted a Water Stone, Eevee will turn blue, gain a scaly neck flap, and grow a long mermaid-like tail. Careful, Vaporeon, otherwise some of those ancient sailors might fall for you instead. And maybe some interesting folks online, too. Like its brothers and sisters, Vaporeon can also learn several moves outside of its own type, including a number of ice attacks on its own and the poisonous Toxic with a TM. Perhaps more importantly, though, it's the only evolution in Canada that can learn Surf, meaning this bad boy can take you anywhere you want, provided it's next to a body of water, of course. What it lacks in attack and defense, it makes up for in HP, and it takes a fair number of hits to knock this fish, cat, fox thingy down. With a naturally varied moveset and that all-important Surf ability, Vaporeon just about ekes ahead of its two counterparts. Don't just take our word for it either. Japan named the Pokemon as its ambassador for the United Nations Water Day in 2023, which, you know, I'm sure means something to someone. Number 37, Marowak. Were you traumatized by our entry on Cubo and earlier, where we talked about how it wears its dead mother's skull on its head? Well, too bad, because here's its evolved form. Now, instead of the skull simply resting atop its head, the bones have apparently fused with it, meaning Marowak's whole head is some nightmarish hybrid of living flesh and deceased parental skeletons. Oh my god, what are they putting in the coffee over at Game Freak? This is a horror show. We're willing to overlook this unfathomable evil, though, in the light of Marowak actually being pretty decent in battle. Its attack is towards the higher end of things, and it's packing a very strong defense stat, all obtainable at level 28, which is far from the worst we've come across so far. Chuck in those same exclusive moves it could learn as Cubone, Bone Club, and Bone Meringue, and the ability to use Strength, and you've got yourself a ground type that will do you well in most fighting scenarios. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to ring my mother. I just want to check and see that her head is still where I remember it being. Number 36, Cloyster. Here we go. Someone sound the highest base defense stat in the whole game, Klaxon. 
What do you mean he didn't bring the klaxon? That was my one request for this entire video! Oh, that's it, I'm done. I can't work in these conditions anymore. Alright, never mind, I'll carry on. If you thought that Shelda had a high defense score at 100, then brace yourselves for the mind-blowing 180 score of its evolved form, Cloyster. When you consider that this colossal crustacean also has a base attack of 95, and you may start to wonder why it isn't even further up the list. Well, let me tell you. First of all, it's got a pretty pitiful HP stat, which is fine because its defense is so high, but still a chink in its armor. Secondly, you'll need to flesh out a lot of Cloyster's attacks with TMs, as it can only learn five different moves on its own. And finally, you can't catch Cloysters in the wild, so your only choice is to evolve a Shelder, which requires one of those pesky water stones. Damn stones, what did we ever do to you? Nonetheless, this is a very impressive Pokemon, though if you ever come up against one, you may need to employ some industrial power tools to get through its tough exterior. Number 35, Golduck. Whilst it may not be as recognizable or hilarious as its previous incarnation, Psyduck, Golduck is, in many other ways, the superior feathered fighter. Find one in the Seafoam Islands or get your headache-inducing pal to level 33, and this big blue duck is all yours. Well, I say duck, but it also does seem to have claws, a long, thin tail, and also some sort of jewel stuck in its head. I don't know, man, we've seen some weird stuff on this list already. I'm not really sure why I'm surprised. A water type, capable of picking up some psychic type moves, as well as the HM, Strength and Surf, Golduck is another example of a Pokemon that has you covered in all the right areas. HP, strong. Attack, above average. Defense, will do the job. It's not super impressive, but in a game where stats can vary wildly within one species, consistency isn't really a bad thing. Really, the only downsides to Goldie are the high level it needs to evolve, and the fact that in order to get one, you need to sacrifice a Psyduck. So for one last time, let's raise a toast to the little yellow maniac. Oh ducky boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. Number 34, Nidoking. The final stage in the male Nidoran's evolutionary line is this Chungus, the most aggressive rat since Rizzo from the Muppets. I, mean, I don't really remember Rizzo being that aggressive, but I'm sure he got sick of Gonzo's crap eventually, right? Nidoking is based on the monster Baragon, am I saying that right? From the Godzilla franchise, so you might expect him to be absolutely humongous. But actually, he's only 1.4 meters tall in universe, which is the same height as a meter ruler on top of something that's 0.4 meters high. Still, don't be fooled by its size, as it's not to be trifled with. This bruiser has the highest attack stat of any Nido creature, which is very handy when you're caught in a scrap. His other stats aren't too bad either, another case of nothing special but far from terrible, making him a reliable hand, or should that be poor, if things go south. Southpaw. You do need to give Nidorino a moonstone for him to make the change, but they're by far the most abundant evolving rocks in Kanto, so that's not a mark against Nido King's name. The male form of Nidoran is capable of great things if trainers are willing to give him a chance. Not as great as their female equivalent, of course, but we'll get there soon enough. Number 33, Pidgeot. Speaking of weakish stage ones that can blossom into something beautiful, check out the final form of everyone's favorite flying type, Pidgey. Pidgeot, which in terms of spelling sounds like it should come before Pidgeotto in the chain, but hey ho, is what happens when the aforementioned bird reaches level 36. It doesn't have the same attack score as Fiero, its closest comparison, but it's much more balanced in terms of numbers, which gives it an advantage in this particular ranking. If we were basing things purely on the facts, then Pidgeot would be a couple of places lower in our list. But look, there was no way we were going to put Ash Ketchum's first flying ace lower than an angry mouse with short man syndrome. Pidgeot is one of Ash's main lads in the anime, always on hand to bash Team Rocket from the air or be on the lookout when someone inevitably got lost. It was there from right at the start of the ten-year-old's journey, an experience mirrored by all us 
trainers who caught a Pidgey early in the game and evolved it all the way. Call us sentimental if you want to, but this pigeon has built its nest right in the center of our hearts. <laughs> ben? Number 32. Aerodactyl. Aside from Kabuto, Omanyte, and their evolved forms, there is one more Pokemon that a player can revive from a fossil in red or blue. And great Jiminy Cricket, look how cool it is! A cross between a pterosaur, a dragon, and a bat from hell, Aerodactyl is what happens when you take the old amber from the Pewter Science Museum to the labs on Cinnabar Island, because someone working on these games had clearly just been watching Jurassic Park. Aerodactyl is strong, very strong, capable of learning moves that inflict a lot of damage, such as bite, takedown, and hyper. Beam. Some of those moves are so powerful that they can damage or incapacitate the user afterwards, which is definitely something to be cautious of. Through TMs, this Terror from the Sky can learn heavy, dragon, fire, and flying attacks, and you can use it to fly around Kanto, which is the closest any of us will ever come to riding a dinosaur. A fairly low defense stat is a bit of a bummer, as is the fact that you have to visit a museum to get your hands on one. Ugh, disgusting! But there's a lot to like about this prehistoric powerhouse. Number 31. Machoke. Speaking of powerhouses, here's the Pokemon equivalent of that guy at your gym who keeps smacking the weights down and going, ugh, and then taking photos in the mirror. The worst. Machoke evolves from Machop at level 28, and what a growth spurt it is! It bulks out significantly, as well as growing a set of fangs and a WWE-style championship belt that's permanently affixed to its waist. Machoke versus John Cena. Now that I'd like to see. Well, you know, you can't see John Cena, obviously, but still, it's fun to think about. Fighting types naturally have strong attacks attacks in Gen 1, and whilst a few non-fighting Pokemon have higher attacks than Machoke, the fact that such power is accessible at such a relatively low level is a huge plus point. Its defense and HP are reasonable as well, meaning that this beefcake can take hits just as well as it can dish them out. Additionally, you can skip the whole evolution process entirely if you want and catch one in the wild on Victory Road, making for a nice last-minute addition to your squad before the Elite Four. With plenty of skills to back up that hefty physique, Machoke easily proves that those muscles are for more than just looking good good. Number 30. Nido Queen. The Nido line of Pokemon evolution is a bit like chess, both in that the Queen is the most powerful part and that it also confuses me a little bit. Also evolved with the help of a Moonstone, Nidorina undergoes its final transformation into Nido Queen, which looks less frightening than its male equivalent, but is actually packing way more under the hood. In universe, Nido Queen has developed such strong defensive capabilities in order to protect its young, while it's up to the dad to fight off any possible threats using brute strength. Strength. That would explain the female's higher defense stat, but like its predecessors, Nido Queen also has a higher HP stat than Nido King. And it's not like its attack stat is anything to sniff at either, as Her Majesty is more than capable of holding her own when the chips are down. Whilst the gap definitely closes at stage 3, the Lady Nido still has the advantage, making her the strongest member of her entire family. Much like my mum then, who you definitely do not want to start an argument with over Christmas dinner. It will not end well for you. Number 29. Rhyhorn. Move over, Machop! Suck it, Sandshrew, and crab off, Krabby! When it comes to the most powerful Stage 1 Pokémon in all of Red and Blue, there's only one horned hero who wears the crown. Rhyhorn, which looks like a rhinoceros had a baby with a tank, has a fairly low catch rate for a Pokémon that can evolve in Gen 1, but that's only because it's an absolute unit. It essentially has zero flaws, boasting a decent amount of health, a nice bit of attack, and a defense stat that makes Fort Knox look like a run-down scout hut. If you want to look for weakness, in this bruiser, then you'll only be wasting your time. On top of that, Rhyhorn is also able to learn a whole host of powerful TMs, ranging from the Electric-type Thunder and the Ground-type Dig to the Fire-type Fire Blast. It can also push boulders out of the way using Strength, although it probably just needs to give them a stern glance to send those rocks running the other way. They can be a bit of a git to catch, and they're only available in the Safari Zone, which is irritating, but if a trainer does manage to land this living bulldozer, then the rest of Kanto had better watch out. Number 28. Venusaur. For the first of our Stage 3 starters, it's over to number 3 in the Pokedex, the formidable Venusaur. This Goliath Garden is what happens when Ivysaur reaches level 32, which is actually four levels lower than the other two starters' final evolutionary gate. The seed on its back erupts into a beautiful flower, which is said to have a scent that can calm anyone down. Can we get a Venusaur in the triple jump offices, please? This place is stress central, especially when Ashton forgets her l lunch. Forgets her lunch. Calm down, Ashton, please. We'll get you a meal deal. 
We'll go no, put down the knives. Though it can be obtained much earlier, this grass type isn't best suited to the final two gym leaders on a trainer's journey. The penultimate leader is Blaine, who uses fire types which will burn this highly flammable fellow in a heartbeat. Then it's Giovanni, a ground type trainer, and what moves have little effect on ground types? Now you understand. It might not be the optimal choice for completing the Kanto League, but Venusaur still packs a punch and can learn some kick-ass moves like Solar Beam and Hyper Beam, making it a worthy companion right to the end. Also, you could probably grow some vegetables on its back and it wouldn't even notice. Useful for when Ashton leaves her sarnies at home. Number 27. Zapdos. Our first legendary bird Pokemon, which also makes it the first member of a legendary trio we've seen on this list, is the flying creature that ain't afraid of no overhead electrical cables, Zapdos. Based on a Thunderbird, the Native American mythical creature, not the uh, weird puppet, Zapdos is a dual electric and flying type, which is unusual as the former is normally super effective against the latter. This makes for some very interesting combinations in battle, expanding the number of situations this flying power station will be useful in. As a legendary Zapdos naturally comes with some fairly beefy stats, but not as beefy as the other birds we'll get to later. There's also the small matter of there only being one of them in the whole game, located at the power plant, and if you mess up trying to catch it, then there's your chance gone. Still, there are fewer more thrilling things in Pokemon than landing a legendary, and Zappy is no exception to that. Though it may be the least preferable of the triumvirate, there's no way any player should turn down the opportunity to add such a formidable and recognisable creature to their roster. Number 26. Scyther. Though it would later gain evolutions with Scizor in Gen 2 and Cleavor in Gen 8, in Gen 1 the bug-slash-rock type Scyther stands alone. And you know what? That's okay. Based on a praying mantis and with all the speed and agility of a highly trained ninja, Scyther is one speedy boy which almost guarantees it to hit first in a battle. When it does hit, it hits hard, boasting an attack stat that puts a certain electric bird to shame. Seriously, Zapdos, up your game, or I'll be forced to pull the plug. Though not common in Kanto, you stand something of a chance of finding one of these if you hang out around the Safari Zone in red. Yes, this is another version exclusive which is still a giant ball ache no matter how much up the list we get. Even though it straddles two different types, Scyther can't learn any bug-type attacks, but it does make up for this shortfall by picking up powerful normal-type moves like Slash and Double Edge. But at the end of the day, it's really this amazing design that has put it so high up in so many players' estimations, including my own. I've got one tattooed on my arm. It can fly, and it's got knives for arms. How awesome is that? Number 25. Articuno. The second member of our legendary aviary is Articuno, representing ice types and all-round cool customers everywhere. The Pokedex states that it can create blizzards by freezing the moisture in the air, which is also how Frozone's powers work in The Incredibles. I really hope that Articuno also has a wife at home that won't tell it where its super suit is. Whilst Zapdos has no major base stat over 100, Articuno has players covered in that regard when it comes to defense, having the highest number in that department out of all three birds. It may have the lowest base attack of the tree, but that doesn't mean it's useless in battle, as moves like Blizzard, Sky Attack and Double Edge will deal serious hurt on anyone who dares step to it. Like the other two legendary flyers, there is just one Articuno in Kanto, and it lives in the Seafoam Islands. This is a drawback in a certain sense, but for all the reasons we outlined in Zapdos's entry, it makes catching one all the more satisfying. If you could resist the temptation to use this mighty beast as a flying mini-fridge, though, then that would be great. Number 24. Machamp. How do you make the already threatening looking Machoke even more imposing? By adding a new set of arms and a beak, obviously. Machamp throws powerful punches that can send the victim clear over the horizon, according to a Pokedex description that sounds like it was written by a Machamp. Actually, according to a later Dex entry, this species is bad with delicate tasks, so I wouldn't ask it to carry anything fragile or knit you a sweater if I were you. Though it would make for a terrible seamstress, Machamp makes for a mighty battler, as it too boasts the joint second highest base attack stat out of any of the original 151. This makes a lot of sense considering it weighs 130 kilograms or 286 pounds if you want to get imperial about this. Machamp could have been even higher up this list, but there's one notable flaw with this beefcake. You need to trade a Machoke via a link cable to get one. Boo! If you do somehow manage to wrangle a muscular pal, then you'll be very pleased with the outcome. Also, could you tell me your technique for convincing people to trade with you? I'm getting a bit desperate over here. Number 23, Polyrath. 
Though still irksome, using a water stone in an evolution is easier than trading, giving Poliwrath the edge over its four-armed rival. The final form of Poliwag and Poliwhirl looks quite similar to its Stage 2 form, although it's about 50% bigger and 500% angrier. The swirl on its stomach also goes the other way to its previous forms as well, but if you have the time to notice that, then you're probably not enjoying the game as much as you should be. Unavailable in the wild, Poliwrath is only obtainable via stone, but you'll be glad you made the journey to Celadon City to buy one. It excels in every stat, with its attack being the lowest, which is weird considering it literally has the word Wrath in its name. It can learn Strength and Surf, big bonus there knowing two HMs, and on the whole it's just a thoroughly good egg. No real weak spots, no super annoying evolution habits, and its type will put you in good stead for those final two gym leaders we talked about earlier. So there you go, Poliwrath is just a dependable hand all round, which actually makes us feel a bit disappointed considering how far up the list we are. Oh well. Number 20. Tauros. The bull Pokemon Tauros actually debuted in Asia in the anime before anywhere else, but the episode in which it featured was banned in most countries for its portrayal of guns. International fans missed Ash inadvertently catch 30 of these beasts while trying to acquire other Pokemon, which ultimately served him right for being such a twerp. Honestly, you could do a lot of damage with 30 Tauroses, as these cow-like creatures are bursting with beef. They've got a lot of attack and defensive points, making them a very useful ally in battle, and while their original health levels leave a little to be desired, they can learn strength, which goes some way towards making up for that fact. Though they do live in the Safari Zone in the game, they're not so simple to get a hold of, unlike their TV show counterparts. That said, their catch rate is still fairly high, and it's also more worthwhile going after one than the anime would have you believe, so don't let that nasty show discourage you from pursuing your Tauros dreams. Just warn Professor Oak that they're coming this time. All right, the man can't handle many more shocks at his age. Number 21. Graveler. At level 25, Geodude transforms into Graveler, which must make its life so much easier. For a start, it has legs now, which is a huge boost, and it gets a second pair of arms. Imagine how much more quickly it can do laundry now. What a blessing. Aside from being better at household chores than Geodude, Graveler is also more powerful in battle, thanks to an increased attack stat and a very impressive defensive number that ranks amongst the highest Kanto has to offer. Now that's what I call rock solid. Yes. The only place to catch Wild Graveler is on Victory Road, the pathway to the Elite Four, which shows you just how much stock the developers put in this brutish boulder. There's just one problem, though. It has a base HP of 55. That's the same as Eevee. You might think we've been exceedingly generous putting something with so little stamina this high up the list, but honestly, for the relatively small amount of work you need to put in for Graveler, combined with its impressive digits elsewhere, the whole HP thing isn't as much of a problem as you'd think. Unless you come up against a water type, then it might might be an issue, but you know. Number 20. Slowbro. When a slowpoke is fishing using its tail and a shelder bites the end of it, the lethargic landlubber will become so shocked that it will stand upright on two legs, which is what sparks this evolution into Slowbro. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, Pokemon is weird, man. Whilst Slowbro doesn't come about by being munched on in the game, evolving it is still a pain, as Slowpoke needs to reach level 37 before it learns to walk on its hind legs. Never fear, though, as unlike some other high-level evolutions, you can catch Slowbro in the wild and relatively easily easily too, which makes a lot of sense when you consider how lazy this species is supposed to be. This is what gives Mr. Bro or Mrs. Bro the advantage, as trainers will get quite a lot of value for a relatively simple catch. Its high defense and health combo make up for its comparatively small attack power, plus it can learn not one, not two, but three HMs. Considering it only exists because a clam bit it on the bum and who hasn't been there, Slowbro isn't a half bad Pokemon to have around. Number 19. Golem. Ha! Golem! No? Okay. Golem, the final form of Geodude and Graveler, is a weird one aesthetically. Whilst its two previous stages have similar colour schemes and overall looks, Golem looks almost completely different. Yes, it's still clearly made out of rock, but it's now much smoother with fleshy looking features awkwardly jutting out. Also, it's only got two arms again. I'd be well annoyed if I gained a set of arms only to lose them as soon as I grew up. With all that said, Golem is just as menacing as the Jewish folkloric figure it shares a name with. It weighs three 
three tons, which is bad news if you're in a lift with one, but great news if you're using one in battle. Its considerable girth is reflected in its bonkers high attack and defense scores, which are both above 100, and in the hefty moves it can learn, such as earthquake, self-destruct, and explosion. Here, however, is the catch. To evolve Graveler, you need to dig out the old link cable again, which is becoming something of a trend with these more powerful Pokemon. Even with this setback, though, Golem is still a rock-solid choice of battle companion. Pun very much intended, and missing arms be damned. Number 18. Exeggutor. Exeggutor is the evolved form of Execute because, as everyone knows, trees come from eggs. It's basic biology, guys. Those round egg things from earlier almost completely change when given a leaf stone to hold, growing to two meters tall, gaining a trunk-like body that sprouts huge leaves, and swapping out its five smirking pink faces for three gormless yellow ones. Is this an upgrade? I honestly don't know. Where there is tangible improvements is in the stats department, as Executor's numbers go way up. Its base attack more than doubles, which is good because Execute was about as strong as a toilet roll tube, and its already impressive defense numbers also get an increase. Not a bad showing then, even if you do need one of those pesky leaf stones to make it happen. They're not available in the wild either, which is just typical. If you want further proof that this walking tree is worth your while, it was the preferred choice of Pokemon Company President Tsunekazu Ishihara during the testing period of Red and Blue. Are you really going to argue with the man who's in charge of all the Pokemon? No. I didn't think so. Number 17. Wheezing. Look at coughing. Oh, look at coughing. See how happy and smiley it is. I wonder how it will look once it evolved. Oh, oh lord, why is it so sad? And was that weird growth coming out of its head? What happened there? What happened was coughing got to level 35 and evolved into wheezing, a larger, more polluting, generally grumpier looking version of the floating gas ball. Still a poison type, wheezing has plenty of ways of wearing down its opponents gradually throughout a match, or it can just blow them up in one go with moves like self-destruct and explosion, which is definitely the option I would go for. Wheezing needs a high level to be evolved, but it can also be caught in the Pokemon Mansion if players have the patience. Its natural resistance to fighting, grass, and other poison attacks is bolstered by a base defense of 100 120, which is towards the top end of things in Gen 1. It has a relatively low starting HP for a Pokemon of its power, but honestly, that's the worst thing about it, and it's not even that bad. You'd think that Weezing would smile more with all that going for it. I suppose floating around in a cloud of smog isn't as fun as it sounds. Hang on, that doesn't sound fun at all. That'll be why then. Number 16. Moltres. Our third and final legendary bird is also the third in the sequence. You can tell this because the bird suffixes are the numbers 1, 2, and 3 in Spanish. Arctic uno, zap dos, and moltres. Side note, our writer only discovered this fact whilst researching this list, and it blew his tiny mind. Found only on Victory Road, the pathway to the Indigo Plateau, Moltres is also one of a kind, meaning that a trainer should take extra care when battling not to wipe it out by accident. If they succeed, then they'll be rewarded with an extremely strong fire-slash-flying type. Moltres has the highest base attack of the three legendary flying lads, and whilst brute force isn't everything, the way the other stats pan out makes it the strongest bird in the nest. Sure, being able to make it snow or charge everyone's phone is nice, but imagine the ability to rain fire and destruction down from the sky. That's the whole reason I play video games. This fiery featherhead may not have come out on top overall, but honestly, it's so satisfying to catch just one of these legendaries. And if you're lucky enough to get your hands on all three, then you are seriously winning at life. Number 15. Blastoise. Okay, Google, when does Squirtle get the gun? Oh, when it evolves into Blastoise. Thanks, Google. After Wartortle reaches level 36, the Squirtle lineage is completed with a literal tank of a Pokemon. With chunky arms and legs, a shell the size of Texas, and two gigantic water cannons on its back, the Blasting Tortoise is ready to face any foe and will water your garden for you, if you ask nicely. Like its pre-evolved forms, Blastoise has the highest base defense stat of its three starter chums, making it the only three starter to have a key base stat in triple figures. Its attack and health stats aren't that far off the others either, making it the obvious choice for fans of maths. 
Nintendo loved the character so much that they made it the box art for Blue, meaning that millions of people across the world had tiny Blastoise portraits in their homes. And they could have done much worse, as this has got to be one of the coolest looking creatures in the entirety of Gen 1. It's a Pokemon with guns! I mean, that's badass on its own. Whilst that is impressive though, and the stats aren't too bad either, there is one more starter evolution that we just couldn't ignore. Number 14, Charizard. The previous entry may have had the numbers advantage, but in terms of overall coolness, it didn't even stand a chance. Also, Gary had a Blastoise in the anime, and I can't stand that guy. The only reason you would ever choose a Charmander at the start of Red or Blue is because you knew that it would get you a Charizard in the end. Well, that or because Charmander is so gosh darn cute. Take your pick. Just look at this absolute beaut, though. The majestic wings, the blazing tail, the confident snarl. This is one of the best looking Pokemon ever created, even after over a quarter of a century of designs. The fire and flying type, which should also be part dragon type considering, you know, it's an actual dragon, found worldwide fame as Ash's boisterous ace on the TV show. Initially resistant to its master's commands, it eventually learned to cooperate with its pint-sized trainer and took part in some of the greatest battles the eternal ten-year-old has ever fought. We haven't even talked about Charizard's in-game stats yet, which are good, though not insanely good, but honestly, do we even need to? This immaculately designed beast would become one of Pokémon's first ever superstars and there's a very good chance that without it, the franchise might not be what it is today. Number 13, Pinsir. From one instantly recognizable pocket monster to another now, only this one will give you nightmares instead of fulfilling your Pokemon dreams. Based on every awful looking insect you've ever seen in a nature documentary, Pinsir, with its spindly arms, sideways mouth, and gigantic horns, is enough to put anybody off going outside for the rest of their lives. In blue, specifically, yes, this is another single game exclusive, please don't hurt me, it wasn't my choice, they can be found hanging out in the Safari Zone or in Celadon City's Rocket Game Corner. It comes with a pretty poor base HP, the same as Persians for context, but if you don't like that, then don't worry, you will love its other figures. With a base attack and defense stat both in the hundreds, Pinsir is not to be trifled with in combat. It's also one of the few creatures in Gen 1 capable of learning the move Guillotine which is a guaranteed one-hit knockout. It doesn't chop anybody's head off though, so don't worry about that. Even Game Freak aren't that sadistic. So there you go, you can put down your swatters and your insect spray, because this bug is one you will definitely want to keep around. Number 12, Arcanine. Are you a red player who's annoyed about not being able to get Pinsir? Well rejoice, because you get to have this red exclusive fire type instead. Take that, blue players! Remember all the praise we heaped on Growlithe earlier? Well, multiply that by 10, because good gravy, look how magnificent its evolved form is. Have you ever seen such a noble steed in all your life? Imagine riding one of these into battle, you'd look glorious. However, Arcanine is more than just a pretty face and a stupid pronunciation. It, it's a pun of arcane and canine, so why isn't it pronounced arcanine? Bloody ridiculous. Anyway, where was I? Uh, yeah, Arcanine also comes equipped with all the skills to win you any fight. It's got oodles of attack power, as shown when it uses moves like Dig, Fire Blast, and Skull Bash. This makes it easily the most dangerous thing I've ever wanted to pet since my next door neighbor's cat that hated me for some reason. As well as only being in one version of the game, Arcanine also requires a Fire Stone, which as we've discussed is a massive pain, but the fact it's this high up the list with both of those caveats just goes to show how good of a companion it is once you actually get hold of one. Don't fret though, blue players, because you can always trade one into your copy of the game. It's a faff, yes, but look at this thing, it's totally worth it. Number 11, Kangaskhan. 
Not to be confused with either the leader of the Mongol Empire or the country that Borat comes from, Kangas Khan is instead what would happen if a kangaroo bred with Godzilla and then started going to the gym. Don't let the fact that this towering creature is a mere normal type let you think that it's dull though, because Kangas Khan kicks some serious butt fueled by the most powerful force on Earth, motherly love. Aww. These Pokémon are 100% female, and thus all come with a pouch that's home to their young. Going off Winnie the Pooh logic, I've got to assume that said young would be called Rugus Khan, right? Makes sense to me. Either way, they care fiercely about their offspring, and have even been known to raise lost human children if they don't have their own. Honestly, if one of these walked up to me and asked for my child, I think I'd let them take it. With high health, strong attack, good defense, and compatibility with electric, fighting, ice, and fire TMs, along with both the surf and strength HMs, Kangas Khan has all the tools to become the primary member of any trainer's squad. Just remember, if it asks for maternity leave, you better damn well grant it. You won't like what happens if you don't. Number 10. Lapras We've talked a lot in this list already about Surf, the special hidden machine that allows players to travel across deep blue water in the game, but when it comes to this move, there is no Pokémon more associated with it than Lapras. Based on water-dwelling plesiosaurs from dinosaur times, with a pinch of Loch Ness Monster thrown in for good measure, Lapras is the ultimate surfing machine, with its broad back, powerful flippers, and friendly demeanor. Ash used one to great effect in the anime during the Orange Archipelago saga, which only adds to this creature's coolness. As well as being handy for travel, though, Lapras also kicks some serious backside on the battlefield. Its high HP makes it incredibly durable, and though its attack stat isn't as high as other Pokémon around it on this list, it's certainly enough to get the job done against most foes. The best thing about Lapras in the game, though, is that players are guaranteed to get one, as they will receive one as a gift from Silphco in Saffron City. All those great stats, its incredible design, and the fact that it's a freebie combine to make Lapras a must-have for our top. 10. Number 9. Muck The only known Pokémon to share a name with one of the vehicles from Bob the Builder, Muck is the evolved form of Grimer. And though the first line of its Pokédex entry is, it's covered with a filthy vile sludge, we beg you not to discount it just yet. Whilst it might have a stench to rival the foulest of the foul, like what happens when you accidentally leave food in the cupboard before going on holiday, Muck certainly doesn't stink when it comes to fighting. Its base attack of 105 will smack you harder than Gorgonzola left in an unwashed sock, and its health rating of the same number will make it harder to get rid of than a grass stain on a clean white shirt, which is to say, pretty dang hard. Muck's natural moveset isn't much, with the only really dangerous attack to worry about being Sludge, but through the magic of TMs it can wage war on opponents using Grass, Electric, and Fire-type offense, as well as the usual fatal kamikaze moves Explosion and Self-Destruct. You'll need to get Grimer to level 38, which is annoying, but if you do, you'll have yourself a companion more useful than an extra-large bottle of Mr. Muscle. Number 8. Kingler Krabby did very well for itself even as an unevolved creature, so it stands to reason that its beefed-up form would do even better. Kingler, also known as Krabby but Big, to us at least, evolves at level 28, which isn't too bad at all, and oh boy do you get a whole lot of crustacean for your buck. It makes up for a pitiful HP by having attack and defense stats both in triple figures, plus it can learn three HMs, Surf, Strength, and Cut. It's also one of the handful of Pokémon able to learn super move Guillotine, and it has a signature move named Crabhammer, which is one of the best move names in the entire franchise. Kingler's poor HP is really the only thing letting it down, as its other stats are wild, its arsenal of moves is eye-watering, and it has a relatively low-level evolution. Plus, it can also be caught in the wild. Marking it down simply for its low HP may seem like nitpicking, but hey, we're close to the top of the list now, and we have to start getting ruthless. Either way, though, let us never forget that you can't spell Kingler without King. 
or, or lure, I suppose, but th that's not important. Number 7. Gyarados 144 entries ago, we met Magikarp, the little fish with big ambitions but absolutely zero upsides. Well, this is its big sibling, and it would like to have some words with you. As illustrated in one of the all-time great Pokemon anime moments, the unassuming Magikarp evolves into one of the most badass creatures in Gen 1 and beyond, the mighty Gyarados. Part water and flying type, this 6.5 meter tall, 235 kilogram monster is everything Magikarp isn't. Strong, resilient, confident, good at time management, handsome, I could go on. In other words, it's the biggest glow up in Pokemon history. Whilst its previous form's main move was Splash, an attack that does absolutely nothing, Gyarados can learn Flail, Dragon Rage, Hydro Pump, and the extremely powerful Hyper Beam. One of only half a dozen Pokemon in Gen 1 able to pick that move up without a TM. All this, and it evolves at just level 20. Granted, getting a Magikarp to level 20 is harder than it sounds, but it is doable. For its insane roster of moves, crazy high attack level, and the fact that it came from such humble beginnings, we are proud to include Gyarados so high up the list. And that's not just because we're scared of it. What? Y yes, Gyarados, I have put you in the top 10. Now please, let my family go. Number 6. Snorlax Snorlax's Pokedex entry says it just eats and sleeps, becoming steadily more slothful, which is roughly my personal journey every Christmas. Whilst living that lifestyle year-round would make me very ill very quickly though, Snorlax's gluttony only serves to make it stronger. This biggest of big boys comes equipped with 160 base HP, the second highest in the whole game. Furthermore, with a base attack of 110, Snorlax is not to be taken lightly. Pun not intended. There are just two Snorlaxes in Kanto, and they're both encountered when they're asleep, blocking the player's path to Fuchsia City. With the use of the Poke Flute, though, trainers can rouse the resting giants from their slumber and enter into battle with them. If they accidentally take them both out though, then that's it. No Snorlax for you. Normally, this would knock a Pokemon down in our estimations, but this cuddly colossus is just so damn lovable that we can't bring ourselves to be mad at it. Plus, if players do successfully add one to their team, they will reap some serious benefits, as Snorlax can learn two HMs and several powerful moves, including the aforementioned Hyper Beam. That is, if they can keep it awake for long enough. Number 5. Sandslash Perhaps the most surprising placement on this entire list, Sandslash is the evolved form of Sand Shrew, and good golly has the little armadillo done well for itself. It evolves at level 22, the second lowest of anything in the top 10 behind Gyarados, and it has a catch rate of just over 20%, which is the highest inside our entire top 20. On the surface, it should be somewhere in the middle of the park, a fairly average addition to Gen 1 but that's not the case at all. Instead, Sandslash has a base attack of 100 and a base defense of 110, one of only a few Kanto residents to have two key stats in triple digits. Furthermore, it can learn both Strength and Cut, and it can pick up game-changing ground-type moves like Earthquake and Dig. Further, furthermore, it looks rad as hell. The angular face, the spiny back, the giant claws, all of these get a big yes from me. You might think we've gone completely crackers putting something so innocuous so far up the rankings, and yes, whilst we have indeed gone crackers, I and mean, we've been talking about Pokemon for what feels like days, we stand by our decision to put this plucky contender in amongst the very best. Number 4. Mewtwo Trainers enter the Kanto Hall of Fame once they've defeated the Pokemon Champion to conquer the Pokemon League and prove that they are the very best like no one ever was. Once this is achieved, players can venture into Cerulean Cave and come face to face with one of the most infamous beasts in series lore, Mewtwo. 
Grown in a lab in an effort to create the ultimate psychic type, Mewtwo not only serves as an epilogue to the main game, but also as the antagonist of the first Pokemon movie, where he cruelly turned Ash to stone and made millions of children and Pikachu cry in the process. In Game Land, it has near-perfect stats across the board, able to deal damage with moves like Psychic and Confusion, receive buffs through Barrier and Recover, and learn some of the most powerful TMs, ranging from Solar Beam to Fire Blast to Seismic Toss. With all this going on then, it's hard to believe that there are three whole Pokémon that we think are better than Mewtwo. Well, it's the low catch rate that harms it partly, and if you can believe it, there are also other out there with even higher stats. Still, Mewtwo is a legendary in every sense of the word, and so deserves a place in the top five. Even if it did single-handedly ruin my childhood. Heartless git. Number 3. Dragonite Dratini and Dragonair are both elegant creatures, capable of floating along a gentle breeze with the utmost grace and sophistication, so it makes total sense that their final form is a living, breathing brick wall. Dragonite is, well, a dragon. Looks like a dragon, flies like a dragon, smells like a dragon. Don't ask us how we know that. Being based on such a powerful mythical creature certainly has its upsides, as Dragonite has the highest base attack in all of Kanto. Don't let the smile and the wave fool you, you are looking at a killer. As a pseudo-legendary, Dragonite actually has a higher combined stat score than all of Kanto's actual legendaries, which is a teensy bit embarrassing for them, but very good for our boy here. Its capability to learn three HMs is impressive, but considering it can also learn Slam, Dragon Rage, and Hyper Beam, you probably won't need to teach it any. The only kicker though, and it's a bloody big one, is that Dragonite evolves from Dragonair at level 55. That's the highest of any in the whole game. But, you know what they say, nothing worth doing is ever easy, and getting your hands on this Master of the Skies is certainly worth doing. Number 2. Rhydon in terms of numbers and numbers alone, Rhydon should probably be at the top of this list. The three main stats of this second and final incarnation of Rhyhorn are all over 100, the only time this occurs in the whole region. It's got the joint second highest attack score out of anything with a defense number not far behind, meaning that even if an opponent stays on the field long enough to land an attack, the chances are it will hardly make a dent. It can learn strength, I mean of course it can, look at it, and also, surprisingly, surf, making it the Pokemon equivalent of an aircraft carrier. It lives as a neighbor to Mewtwo in Cerulean Cave, which might actually be the easiest place to get one, as trainers will need to grow their Rhyhorn to level 42 to evolve one on their own. That's the biggest level needed to go from Stage 1 to Stage 2 in the whole generation. As with Dragonair though, good things come to those who wait, and Rhydon's power and strength are certainly worth hanging around for. Unfortunately for our horned friend though, Pokemon is not a game played using only maths. Heart comes into it too, and for that reason, the top spot simply has to go to… Ben? I don't mean the top spot's gone to Ben, he's gonna tell you. Number 1. Mew. You've waited all this time for the final spot in this list, and fittingly, it goes to the final Pokémon in the original Pokédex. Originally designed by Shigeki Morimoto to be given away as part of a promotional event, ordinary players ended up being able to capture Mew due to a glitch, and many were grateful for that fact. Mew is extremely powerful, which reflects its position in Pokémon lore as one of the most mysterious, enigmatic creatures in the entire world, let alone Kanto. It had the power to stop Mewtwo's rampage in the first movie, and has appeared numerous times in various forms across the franchise, acting as messiah and guide to those it deems worthy. It also has the unique ability of being compatible with every single TM and HM in Kanto, meaning it can learn pretty much any move in the game. And if that's not enough to convince you, then just look at its little face. Isn't it the cutest demigod you've ever seen? 
for its role in the Pokemon universe, its legendary status within the game, and for its cultural impact on the real world, Mew is our pick for the very best monster that you can fit in your pocket. You can disagree if you must, but we simply don't have the energy to fight you on it. It's been a long old list.